Well, welcome everyone. My name's Dick Beamish. And thanks to all of you that are joining this three-day conference and in particular, our colleagues that are, are presenting papers. Uh, a number of years ago, we proposed that we needed to work as an international team of researchers if we were to understand how a changing climate would affect the capacity of the ocean uh, to produce Pacific salmon. And this eventually resulted in the two expeditions that we're talking about uh, over the next three days. Now we organized these privately supported expeditions to begin to identify the mechanisms that regulate Pacific salmon production. So over the, the next three days, uh, we will be putting together some of the pieces that I think will help all salmon researchers see what we call a bigger picture. And it's interesting that those of you that know the commercial salmon catches in 2020, that there's probably some urgency in the research that we are doing now because of the unexpected poor total catch of salmon by all countries. And again, hopefully over the, the next three days, we will identify some of the possible explanations for, look, at we can call this a, a basin scale collapse of salmon production. Now, we had strong support for our, to our, for our two expeditions from a number of organizations and individuals. But the Russian government in particular was very supportive. And we are very fortunate that uh, Dr. Shestakov, he will open our conference. Now, Dr. Shestakov is the deputy minister of agriculture of the Russian Federation and head of the Federal Agency of Fisheries. Uh, he graduated from St. Petersburg State University of Economics and Finance and has a doctoral degree from the Russian Academy of Public Service and that's under the president of the Russian Federation. And he is a strong supporter of the International Year of the Salmon. Уважаемые коллеги, рад приветствовать вас на международной научной конференции, посвященной особенностям зимнего периода жизни тихоокеанских лососей и результатам исследований двух экспедиций в заливе Аляска. Морской период жизни этого вида рыб является наиболее продолжительным, но при этом остается наименее изученным. Современный уровень исследований не позволяет достоверно оценивать влияние различных биотических и абиотических факторов на численность и продукционные показатели тихоокеанских лососей в океанический период, а также определять уровень их смертности. Из-за этого существуют противоречивые мнения, страдает точность прогнозов. Несомненным успехом на пути совместного изучения зимней экологии тихоокеанских лососей являются экспедиции, проведенные в 2019 и 2020 годах в заливе Аляска. Они опирались на многолетний опыт российских морских исследований с привлечением передовых методов обработки данных, применяемых в Канаде, США и Японии. Сегодня, когда мы столкнулись с перераспределением запасов и изменением миграции рыб, вызванных климатическими изменениями, наша совместная работа приобретает еще большую значимость. В России 2021 год объявлен годом лосося. Мы усилили научную программу в этом направлении, так как лососевая путина имеет важное социально-экономическое значение для Дальнего Востока России и страны в целом. В то же время, учитывая большие сроки и ареалы обитания лососи в море, нужны масштабные и комплексные экспедиционные исследования, которые под силу только международной кооперации. Уверен, что сегодняшняя встреча будет интересной и плодотворной, и по ее итогам мы сможем впервые детально обсудить недавно полученные результаты съемок 
и спланировать предстоящую в 2022 году новую Тихоокеанскую международную экспедицию. Несмотря на сложные обстоятельства, с которыми столкнулись организаторы, мы надеемся на то, что экспедиция состоится и даст ответы на многочисленные вопросы динамики численности тихоокеанских лососей. So, let me thank Dr. Shostakov again, and I think you'll agree that his welcome identifies the importance of the next three days. Now, a benefit of of this um, of this format is the opportunity to relax while we're listening to the presentations, and I am going to do that with a nice glass of red wine. I'm going to turn this now over to Derek Hader, and he's going to tell everybody a little bit about the production of the conference. Thanks, Dick. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Derek Hader. I am with Avoid Productions. We're based here in Vancouver, BC, and we are the company that's been looking after the tech side of this event. Uh, this webpage you're on right now watching this live stream, uh, this is where you'll go each of the three days to watch the event, so please come back each day. Uh, below this video window, further down the webpage, you'll see we've posted the agenda, which is full of lots of great presentations. Each presenter will deliver their presentation and then respond to some questions from you, the audience. Uh, to submit your questions, you'll see a window on this page. It's the Q&A window. Use this Q&A window to submit your questions to each presenter during their presentation or just following it during the Q&A session. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. And now I'm going to throw it over to Dr. Brian Riddle. Brian, over to you. Thank you, Derek. Well, we're finally here. Uh, and with a wonderful introduction from Russia like that. I want to also note right away that this is being enabled by a donation from the BC Northern Development and Innovation Fund. Uh, they were a supporter of the 2020 cruise. And then under COVID, uh, of course, we couldn't meet in person. And they have been extremely cooperative in allowing us to carry these money forward. And uh, so they will be paying for our conference. And then they have generously allowed us to maintain anything remaining to towards our March 20, our 2022 cruise. So a hearty thank you to the BC Northern Development and Innovation Fund here. As for where we're going with this, I want everybody to think forward. We're looking at what we've learned and what we don't know or what we don't know, I suppose. And that as we go into the International Year of the Salmon and the multi-vessel cruises, first in, in decades. Uh, so I think we appreciate the importance of this effort. And uh, I'm very happy to announce that Dr. Beamish and I have received funding to participate next March with a gill netter to add to the sampling and testing as we uh, will build into the survey plan. So I am very, very happy that we've got to this point. Uh, it has been a struggle through the past year for us all. And so I, I really want to thank all of our participants for their uh, sticking to the plan to do the analyses and to cooperate in these more difficult conditions uh, to put together what I'm sure are going to be a great uh, diversity of talks and the first sort of reveal of all the information. Uh, we do plan to have this published in a forum. Uh, this will be through the NPAFC, which I think is appropriate, and we'll try to give you more specifics on that as we proceed. So I don't think I have anything more to say other than I'd like to introduce our next speaker. We're a little bit ahead, but Vladimir, are you set to go if we do this? I think we're all set there. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Let me start my talk. I would like to talk to you about winter ecology of Pacific salmon in the open ocean. I would like to start from mentioning of predecessor talk by Kate Myers with co-authors 
They presented an excellent talk on Pacific salmon and still had life in a changing winter ocean. And article of them was later published in the NPFC bulletin number six. In their study, coasters tried to answer a set of questions. Where do salmon go in winter? Why? And how might this be affected by climate change? The first questions were recently became clear. New information was collected in scarcely studied regions and seasons. Several summary reviews were published on marine life phase of Pacific salmon. And considering second question, why scientists remain puzzled and often say contradictory things. I would like to present my opinion to clarify why salmon species differ by places they occupy in winter, feeding habits and trophic relationships. Main data sources for my conclusions are general database publications, please see them on the slide, two Gulf of Alaska cruise reports, as well as other NPFC documents, data files, and data from numerous NPFC publications. Ocean world salmon migration differ from migration of salmon returning to spawning regions. Returning salmon use the Earth's magnetic field as a hydrochemical properties of river runoff water for navigation to arrive exactly at the mouth of native spawning river. In the case of oceanward migration, there is no exact uh, point of arrival, and wintering salmon arrive in a relatively large area, characterized by favorable environment and conditions, food supply, and so on. If such conditions are encountered along the way, salmon stays there until the situation changes. Analysis of conditions in wintering areas, favorable for different salmon species and groups, allow to understand their physiological requirements, features of the wintering biotopes, and ecological habits. And yes, we will start from pink salmon. At the beginning, it will be useful to see how pink salmon stock abundance is distributed between the North Pacific regions. As you see from the slide, on this uh, commercial cage diagram, pink salmon stocks are mostly originated from Russia and the United States rivers. And they migrate to the ocean from the Sea of Okhotsk, Bering Sea, and waters of Central and uh, Southeast Alaska. We can delineate three large domains of pink salmon wintering, likely associated with the Sakhalin Islands stocks, Western and Eastern Kamchatka stocks, and North American stocks. In general, pink salmon area in winter stretches from southwest to northeast. And there are also some pink salmon stocks overwintering in the Sea of Japan. Revealing in 1990, pink salmon overwintering in the icy Sea of Okhotsk serves a good illustration of salmon temporary residence in area characterized by favorable environmental and food conditions. Southeastern part of the Sea of Okhotsk um, is under impact of employing Pacific waters, and it distinguished by water structure with well-expressed thermocline, as you can see in the lower left corner of this slide. In January, early February, density of pink salmon aggregations there allowed observing the allocation by hydroacoustic devices, and in most cases, they were found in 80, 120 meter depths. Likely, pink salmon increase a vertical range of its distribution and decrease the rate of horizontal movement in winter. And it looks to be a general rule for salmon Deeper layers of residence mean fewer horizontal movements. Pink salmon wintering in the Sea of Okhotsk likely has a sufficient uh, food supply. Food resources for the plankton are brought there by inflowing Pacific waters and accumulate near so-called uh, liquid bottom, which serves uh, as, uh, as which serves a thermocline. Pink salmon likely search for plankton 
consuming small food particles brought by the currents. So mostly vertically known migratory zooplankton. In juvenile pink salmon diets, we found hyperids, pteropods, appendicularians, and fish larvae. In general, diet becomes enormously diverse, while daily food ration was twice less than in autumn. The plant and resources allow pink salmon to stay there for a long time until the mid-March. In the western North Pacific, pink salmon aggregate along the subarctic current fronts. Position of southern boundary of pink salmon range in winter depends on oceanological logical condition of the year. According to Chindro colleagues, Alexander Figurkin and Svetlana Idenka, pink salmon are more abundant there under compressed status of the western subarctic gyre than stretched one, since the first status provides with a wide area between southern and northern subarctic fronts. There is a hypothesis that position of southern boundary of pink salmon distribution also depends on their abundance, but this is not supported by the presented maps. In, 2000, in 1989 and especially 1991, pink salmon run to the Asian, Asian coast was much more powerful than in 1987, which is presented on the top right corner of this slide. Winter service of 2009 displays well a relative separation of winter areas or for the southern Sea of Okhotsk stocks, I mean the Sakhalin Islands and southern Kurils, and the, the Kamchatka stocks. At the same time, no finer structure of winter in aggregation that can be related to regional or seasonal subdivisions of pink salmon stocks was revealed. The Sea of Okhotsk stocks likely well intermix in the deep water area within the sea, and then migrate together through relatively narrow southern Kuril Straits and spend the most part of winter together in the same feeding areas. Pink salmon dense aggregation are associated to the southern and northern fronts at the boundaries of mixed water domain along the subarctic current. The plant and aggregation are densest just at the fronts. This is explained by model shape on the distribution curve that you can see for a series of survey in 1980s, 1990s. And we have found this by model shape, not only in our da data, but also on a graph for April, May from Cantaros Marita article. You can see it on a lower left corner of this slide. In the Gulf of Alaska, winter research cruises allowed us to guess that pink salmon of Alaska stocks should also overwinter along the subarctic current fronts. Since the subarctic current uh, divided the year into two branches, originated the Alaska current and California current, pink salmon likely found more favorable condition along the southern stream, and um, likely the more well-expressed temperature gradient is a reason for this choice. Therefore, main aggregation can be expected throughout the area where pink salmon were found in April, May of 1990. You can see that on the top uh, left corner of this slide. If this assumption is correct, a one-month stroll survey can give an estimate of pink salmon run magnitude in the main regions of salmon fishery in the North America. And Alexis Soma will describe this approach in his talk in more details. The next species under consideration is the chump salmon, the most abundant salmon in the North Pacific Ocean. Sometimes expert place at chump salmon second, thereby missing the point of existence of several years classes spending mainly three, four winters at sea. Chum salmon is also the most uh, domesticized salmon, considering proportion of hatchery originated stocks and the total species abundance. Japan led in chum salmon hatchery propagation and fishery harvest for a long time before the mid of the last decade. Then, unexpected decline of chum salmon run happened, which is more frequently explained by the climate warming 
and deterioration of environmental condition for salmon at the southern edge of the areas. Last year, about equal portion of chum salmon was fished by Russia from one side and Japan and the United States together from another side. At the same time, total chum salmon harvest in the Northern Pacific gradually declines since 2015. There are also several large domains of chum salmon winter residents in the western North Pacific central part in, in the Gulf of Alaska. In the central North Pacific, chum salmon distribution looks to be more dispersal. Likely, this feeding area is of secondary importance. Chum salmon can be found near, in the near bottom layers, the shelf age in the winter, and such catches were recorded as from the Bering Sea and the Sea of Okhotsk, as well from the eastern North Pacific. It is assumed that chum salmon can overwinter in the Sea of Japan, but its catches there in December to March are not known. Significance of the Sea of Okhotsk for juvenile chum salmon in, of all Asian stocks was recently shown. In autumn, juvenile chum and pink salmon behave in the Sea of Okhotsk as a complementary species with similar patterns of distribution and with very similar body weight. They explore food resources together and likely remain under impact of the same factors. And um, it's, at least they demonstrate similar trend of uh, abundance dynamic that you can see on this graph from the left side. In contrary to pink salmon, almost all chum salmon left the Sea of Okhotsk area before winter with some rare occurrence in the southeastern part of sea only. Chum salmon juveniles start leaving the Sea of Okhotsk in abundance since October. That month, their migration pathway lays through the northern Korean, northern Korean Straits. One month later, many juvenile enter the Pacific waters through the middle uh, Kuril Straits. And remaining salmon aggregate in the southern part of area. It is was shown on the previous slide. They leave the Sea of Forts and enter Pacific Ocean in December and January. <clears throat> Older age group of chum salmon live to the ocean earlier than the first marine year winter juveniles. Catches of single deviant fish are mostly observed, but nevertheless, relatively large catch of chum salmon in the outer shelf area was recorded uh, in the northern part of the sea. Some larger chum salmon can remain in deeper layers in the lower part of the sea shelf in winter, where it frequently occur in bottom troll catches during survey and ground fish fisheries. All chum salmon age groups intermix in the Pacific waters. Catches of older age groups usually occur in the same regions as for the fish of the first marine year. Likely, regardless of age, chum salmon pursue the same food resources. It was revealed that the diet spectra of chum salmon of different age groups are very similar, for exception of the most uh, largest and oldest chum that likely start feeding up on micronectin more actively. Anticyclonic eddies along the major currents create the main habitat for chum salmon residents in the ocean. In the northern hemisphere, anticyclonic eddies accumulate in the any passive uh, floating particles, including big planktonic, uh, planktonic swimmers, are formed on the left side of major currents. Chains of anticyclonic eddies persist along the northern front of Kuroshio current, and of course in the Gulf of Alaska, created by uh, currents of the Alaska Gyre. Chum salmon is well adopted physiologically to feeding on gelatinous zooplankton. This salmon has bulky stomach with thin walls and esophagus ending by a powerful splinter that prevents uh, food regurgitation when a large volume is consumed. Correspondingly, chum salmon aggregations are often observed in a peripheral zone of anticyclonic edges where planktonic food is mechanically accumulated. 
Sakai salmon is considered as the most cold water Pacific salmon species. However, in the winter residence in areas slightly northward of other salmons, mostly related to preferable water structure than to preferable temperatures to which Sakai salmon are rather tolerate. Sakai salmon are mostly fished in Alaska with the hottest spot in the Bristol Bay and on the Kamchatka coast. Sakai spend warm season mostly in the Bering Sea and adjacent Pacific waters, and its migration to wintering grounds lasts not too much long as for pink or chum salmon. In Canada, Sakai salmon uh, make fishermen happy every four years, and hopefully such celebration will come next year. In winter, most of Sakai aggregate in the Central Pacific, where they migrate from the Bering Sea through the Western Aleutian Passes. Sakai dwell in areas with a typical subarctic water structure, and while seasonal thermocline is diluted by intensive water mixing in transitional seasons, two-layer water structure is still observed in winter along the Alaska current and the Alaskan stream, where relatively warm Pacific waters overflow well mixed subsurface water domain. In the western North Pacific, Sakai mostly occur in area between 160-170 degree north and east, and where they also migrate from the western Bering Sea. According to Shunta van Temnik, when juveniles Sakai of the first marine year from the western Kamchatka coast also migrate to the Bering Sea in the first marine months. From uh, Sakai cage distribution uh, in surveys, it looks that main aggregation of Asian Sakai remain mostly in the eastern longitudes, while American Sakai mostly in the western longitudes. Meanwhile, genetic analysis recently revealed examples of much longer migration of individuals from some signature Sakai stocks for example, a Chilco Lake from the Fraser River watershed. Patterns of American Sakai migrations uh, are well developed, while for Asian Sakai, widely cited circuit by Kamchatnir authors uh, cannot be accepted. First, rare Sakai migrate so far south, definitely not southward of 40 degree north. And second, Sakai salmon early cycle of migration does not look like uh, this Vernet beetle uh, circles. Summarizing seasonal distribution of juvenile Sakai salmon, I would like to propose an amended, uh, an amended pattern of Asian Sakai migration to emphasize significance of the Bering Sea for these salmon species. The 2018 Gulf of Alaska survey clearly showed Sakai salmon adherence to subarctic waters with two-layer structure. Nine from ten Sakai catches larger than one fish per hour occurred northward from latitude 52 degrees north, where the mixed layer depth was notably less, about 50 meters, than southward, where it reached 100 meters. This circumstance can impact increase of Sakai troll catches, both due to salmon distribution density increase throughout the area of better food conditions and due to shrinking of vertical distribution range. It is known that Sakai salmon are a good diver, and this salmon prefers to feed near the thermocline, where vertically migrating the plankton are accumulated due to a concentrating, a concentrating effect of any physical border. Such feeding behavior can partly explain notable prevalence of Sakai nighttime catches before daytime catches in our winter survey. Biologically, Sakai is more adopted to feed visually in the dusk. It possesses a bigger eyes adopted for visual detection of food in the dusk and have many midwater zooplankton and nicton prey in the diet. In addition, I would like to mention that Sakai display a similar pattern of daily redistribution in a freshwater period in the big lakes. 
Companion Food Ration of Cham Salmon and Sakai Salmon in the Gulf of Alaska in winter. Diets differ significantly besides euphausit, which are preferable food for the most of salmon species. As expected, sham salmon using plankton accumulation by waters mostly had a remainder of its ration consists of uh, gelatinous zooplankton and appendicularians. Sakai is fed up on fish and juvenile squid and tyropods, which resources are most plentiful in the near boundary layers. Comparing fish components of diet from piercy paper, flat fish and sea perch, larvae and fry were mostly found in chum salmon uh, stomachs, while Sakai preyed for uh, mesopelagic fish, including myctophids and other midwater myctonecton species. In respect to deeper dwelling, Sakai salmon are exposed to attacks of interzonal pelagic predator, lancet fish and dagger tooth much more frequently than chum salmon. In summer of 1992, 4.3% of Sakai and less than 1% of chum had the typical slash marked bounds in the Pacific waters of the North Kurils. About 5% and in some years up to 12% of Sakai migrating to the British Columbia streams carried tracks of dagger tooth attacks. David Welsh with Cossars found jaw fragment of dagger tooth just in Sakai salmon body. Coca salmon spent in the ocean up to 18 months before returning to their natal streams. Therefore, it spends only one winter in marine environment and, unlike other salmon species, continue growing in the subarctic current zone from October to April, with a daily rate of about one millimeter. Since mid-1990s, the total commercial coho salmon cage fluctuated at a level of 25,000 metric tons. Russia portions started gradually growing since 2006, and finally exceeded Alaska portion last year. Increasing catches in Russia can be partially related to improvement of fishery statistics and combating of uh, IUU fishing. Southern border of the Coho Salmon Range runs somewhat south of its freshwater part in Asia, while Coho Salmon distribution boundary passes approximately along the 40 degree north. Several authors indicate even more southerly limit. Indeed, the border can pulsate in connection with latitudinal movements of the subarctic current fronts in different years. If comparing with the Western North Pacific, the Coho salmon distribution is a degree of magnitude higher in the Gulf of Alaska. In general, Coho salmon migration pattern remains the most poorly studied among Pacific salmon species. Varnavska guessed that all coho salmon of Asian and American stocks overwinter in the southern Gulf of Alaska. However, coho salmon occurrence in the western and central North Pacific contradicts with such guess. Coho is common in the cages in the central North Pacific, but aggregations here in winter are rather unstable. In February, March of 2009, Coho salmon catches there were high, even higher than our catches during troll survey in the Gulf of Alaska in 2019. In spring of 1991, coho salmon were captured at the southern limits of the survey area only, and in early February of 2019, during the research vessel Professor Kahanovsky passage to Vancouver, Coho salmon were met in cages only in only three from nine troll cows and in very small amount. The same time, coho salmon can be found a year round throughout the shelf at the North America coast. Despite proportion of uh, coho salmon abundance in the Strait of Georgia and the ocean side of Vancouver Island, changes between autumn and winter season. Coho salmon were captured uh, there 
in this area around the year, including the winter months. That is why coho salmon always considered as a salmon species with mostly near coastal distribution. Spending more time near the coast make coho salmon more susceptible to near coastal predators. Alexei Arlov showed that from all Pacific species, Chinook and coho salmon were more frequently attacked by Pacific lamprey. Another story is marine mammals' predation on coho salmon. Seal consume more than half of juveniles of coho salmon abundance in the Strait of Georgia, and this consumption continues in winter months. Even in the Gulf of Alaska in uh, February 2019, we caught as coho salmon individuals that had a mark of seal's bite. Coho salmon diet in the Gulf of Alaska in 2019 differed by a strong prevalence of chiropod cleopyramidata, likely due to deficit of micronectin in upper pelagic layer in February, March. While we have no observation of coho salmon behavior in the water column in winter, from existing data we can observe that actively searching and diving below to 60-70 meter depths is more characteristic for coho salmon in summer months, in July and August. Early in season and later when coho started to move to the shores, uh, it mostly occupies the shallow water layers. Likely, coho salmon horizontal movements are highly intensive that required dwelling in the upper water layers, well saturated by oxygen. At the end of my coho section, um, <clears throat> I would like to advertise a presentation by Dick Bimish with co-authors on new information about coho salmon. Coho salmon behavior and feeding strategy at high seas will be considered there in detail. As a spoiler, I would like to cite Sakhniro colleagues Andrei Zhivogladov, who described the group behavior of coho salmon in the Sakhalin rivers. Likely, not only Sakai salmon can hold its freshwater habits in marine environment. Chinook are relatively rare salmon in the troll catches in upper pelagic zone. Commercial catches of these uh, valuable salmon species regrettably declined from year to year and dropped below 5,000 metric tons in 2018. Most part of Chinook is harvested in the North America from Alaska to California. In winter, Chinook catches an upper pelagic layer almost disappear from the map of, of its range. Scattered distribution of such catches in the Western North Pacific is mainly explained by a significant number of research efforts in the Western North Pacific. In the Eastern North Pacific, Chinook occurred in catches along the outer shelf from Alaska to the uh, Washington State coast. Juveniles of uh, the first ocean winter predominate in catches of uh, Chinook salmon in autumn and early winter in the western North Pacific. While the most of them dwell shelf domain still in September, in October they start migrating in the deep water areas with the general southeastern direction. Pico salmon outmigrant outmigrants abundance is reached in waters of the Kamchatka Peninsula coast in November, while most of them then migrate to the subarctic current area in December and January. Juvenile and immature Chinook salmon keep themselves dispersed and mostly captured by troll in a single numbers in winter. Chinook catches did not exceed 10 fish per hour for exception of one survey in spring in 1989. Beyond the pelagic realm, Chinook salmon can overwinter in near bottom layer. In the Bering Sea, many Chinook were captured during the bottom troll survey as well as uh, by caught during commercial fisheries for live pollock and ground fish. Based on Tinra data of 1974-1991, Chinook can be met throughout the whole outer shelf and upper continental slope from Lutersky Bay to the Bristol Canyon. Chinook bycatch and walleye pollock fishery is a very important fisheries management problem. 
Despite all undertaken measures, including fish restriction in areas of the most frequent salmon occurrence, Chinook by catch still exceed 15,000 fish per year, including salmon from almost all major North American stocks. Based on Chinook diet studies, we connect near bottom Chinook distribution with its prey distribution. In summer, Chinook on the first and second marine years mostly consume juvenile squid dwelling upper pelagic layer, while all the Chinook hunt for larger squid, keeping themselves closer to the bottom. Chinook measurements in the Bering Sea show that pelagic troll catches usually consist of younger Chinook, while catches by bottom troll from older and larger fish. This is also evident on example of Chinook behavior with the data storage tag. In its second winter, this fish started dipping, uh, diving uh, deeper and spending more time in deeper waters. In the Strait of Georgia, overwintering Chinook salmon present an important prey for residential orca whale population. And there is also a winter sport fishery for Chinook in that area. This fishery provides some data on Chinook feeding. And as you can see from diagram, Chinook salmon mostly prey for fish there. A portion of non-fish prey don't exceed 5%. Cherry salmon is distinguished the most from all other Ancarinho species. Frankly speaking, cherry salmon never became a true oceanic form in the strict sense of this term. Its distribution almost not associated with the high seas. Only a small part of cherry salmon stocks spend some part of the marine life in the waters of the western outskirts of the North Pacific. We can say that the cherry salmon is a salmon of the Sea of Japan and Sea of Okhotsk. Almost only Japan reports commercial catch of cherry salmon that usually don't exceed 1,500 metric tons. If look attentively at the graph, Russia's contribution in 5 to 20 metric tons also can be recognized. At the same time, cherry salmon is the most popular species for recreational fisheries since it uh, migrates in streams earlier than other salmon species in southern latitudes. In winter, cherry salmon aggregate in the eastern part of the Sea of Japan. However, some individuals can be met northward up to the Tartar Strait and also near the Southern Kuril Islands. Cherry salmon were met in Valai Polak fishery by catch in the Kunashir Strait that makes it similar with Chinook salmon from the Bering Sea. Cherry salmon migration pathway from the western Kamchatka coast lays across the southern Sea of Okhotsk where it can occur in a relatively high abundance in October, November, up to 15, 21 fish per hour of troll. In winter, as well as during spring summer migration, cherry salmon feed intensively. The basis of its diet are small fish, including Japanese anchovy, uh, scapling, sandlands, juveniles of arabesco greenland, Valai Pollock, as well as squid and amphipods. Despite chili salmon mostly stays in the marginal seas, it also can be preyed by pelagic predatory fish of the oceanic realm. In August 1994, we had a rare observation of chili salmon preyed by daggertooth. Daggertooth specimen with two chili salmon in Stovak was caught in the upper layer in the Sea of Okhotsk of the northern Kuril Islands. Summarizing the bulk of information presented today, we can conclude that distribution, migration patterns, and feeding habits differ significantly for different Pacific salmon species. Since different species of salmon reside uh, the, areas, uh, the same areas uh, from year to year, they seem to be guided to find these areas by large-scale elements of the water structure, like the main currents, gyres, and quasi-stationary eddies. Species uh, wintering habitats were formed for each salmon species 
during the entire series of the previous generation. And they were formed by the most successful surviving individuals who then returned to spawning ground and left offspring. Therefore, in winter, the specialization of certain species and even geographic group of salmon of the same species is more clearly manifested. It can be also assumed that contemporary salmon species and forms use each and every possible tactic of survival in winter. If somewhere there is an available food resource under conditions that would allow salmon to survive over winter, or there is an area with powerful condition, uh, Pacific salmon with a, a high adaptability and intermutation could form a group, morph, or even a subspecies that would master such resources and areas in a relatively short time. Salmon penetration to the Arctic shows that well. This slide on comparison of salmon species feeding behavior with some terrestrial counterparts is not very scientific. Indeed, no close similarity is possible in so different environments. The purpose of this slide is to get you to memorize the main idea of my talk. Pacific species are different, uh, uh, Pacific salmon species, and behave differently in the winter ocean. That decreases the interspecific uh, competition in the most possible degree and gives all salmon species a chance to survive and thrive. Sorry for a long talk and any questions? Well, Vladimir, that is a rich, rich talk. Thank you very, very much. Mark, are you seeing any uh, questions? Uh, no, I'm not seeing any questions at this point. Um, uh, Everybody's in the audience overwhelmed? Feel, I think so. Um, you know, please uh, put your questions up and uh, we'll make them available. Well, Mark, let me ask a question then in the interim, in the sense. So, Vladimir, your final slide, I thought that was a great summary in the sense, but the, the fundamental point are you making is that the species have evolved different winter ecologies or behaviors that enable the different species to share a limited resource? Yes, correct, Brian. Here's just a main idea what I would like to say. Uh, studying Pacific salmon in the marine environment, uh, I found a lot of evidences that they behave uh, differently in finding the better resources and better way to survive during all this uh, long and dangerous period. So in winter, these uh, evidences became even more clear compared to time of Pacific salmon migration. When Pacific salmon migrate, they usually occupy the same level and the same area, since it's uh, not so big choice for them. They need to swim quickly, they need to consume more oxygen, it all will be only in the upper layer. But when they arrive this wintering area, they a little bit coming slower and trying to find their ecological niche, which they will explore during this relatively calm period until, of course, they will go back to the natal rivers. Uh, Brian, I've okay. got a question here, if you, if that's good. Uh, yeah. Question from Lori Whitecap. Uh, folks should be able to see it. The, the ocean is changing. Which species is most likely to be impacted the most by a warming ocean? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Lori, for these uh, great questions. Uh, if the ocean is changing, you know, and we all know, all species will be um, affected by this uh, situation. But uh, the species will also react in different ways, and some of them will occur more adopted to this uh, changing ocean than other ones. Of course, from the um, uh, biological postulates, we can uh, con uh, conclude that the younger species will be more 
adopted and older in the evolutionary perspective will be less adopted. So maybe uh, such species as uh, uh, Chinook and cherry salmon under the more danger with these changing oceans and, for example, pink salmon. But uh, I'm also trusting uh, adaptability and interpretation that uh, all chum salmon species demonstrate sometimes. And I hope that maybe they will find a way to survive in this changing ocean. Thanks, Vladimir. Are you doing there, Mark? Yeah, that's uh, that's it. We've just had the one question from Lori. People are shy out there right now. Yeah. So, Vladimir, the other question is that obviously Beamish was fishing in the wrong place last year for pink salmon. We I were too far north. It's not the dig's blame. Actually, it was uh, <laughs> some mutual production of this uh, cruise plan. And actually, I expected that uh, due to warming ocean, uh, pink salmon uh, wintering grounds will move a little bit uh, to north. But uh, <clears throat> actually, it was a mistake, I think. And I think the most of pink salmon from the North America spent the winter in this big meander at the beginning of California current. At least due to biotopic structure, it's the most suitable area for good uh, feeding migrations of pink salmon. Maybe we will uh, check this hypothesis during the next year expedition. Mm -hmm. uh, agree 100%. I was just running down. This is our first hypothesis to test. And that so one of the things that we yeah. did observe, and particularly for pinks, is there a question there, Mark? Yeah, they're starting yeah. to come in now. Uh, so good. we've got one good. from uh, Gennady. Um, a good time all. Nice talk, uh, Vladimir. Are there differences in survival strategies between the North Pacific and North Atlantic salmonids? Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Gennady, but maybe I am not the best address for such a question. Almost very general knowledge about North Atlantic uh, salmon. And uh, I don't see I can spend uh, our mutual time to try to answer this question. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Vladimir. Uh, Christoph uh, Dieg uh, asks, which species would you expect to experience the largest changes in distribution in a warming ocean? OK, yes. Uh, I thought about that, and I think that the chum salmon can be in less beneficial position in a warmer ocean. Since uh, actually this uh, chum is uh, mostly rely on f food resources accumulated by water currents that will be changed in the warmer ocean, and likely it will uh, alter the migration pathways and also together with uh, uh, growth of water temperature, it may be harmful for chum salmon stocks. But for such species as uh, Sakai salmon, it's still, still a good um, uh, reserve of feeding resources and feeding areas in winter. And for pink salmon, it's a big reserve uh, related to penetration to Arctic. And maybe if the ocean will warm with the same rate as now. Uh, pink salmon can establish the um, uh, population which will live within the Arctic seas even without going into the Pacific Ocean as we observe for the Japan Sea populations. All right, thank you, Vladimir. There's uh, one more here. Um, it wasn't signed, so it's anonymous. Um, just wondering if there were any major shifts in distributions throughout um, throughout the Gulf of Alaska from the 2019 and 2020 surveys compared to earlier surveys, uh, or if there have been updated surveys in the Western Pacific since the surveys in the 80s that have shown shifts over time. Okay, yeah, actually uh, I think it will be another talk on uh, mm -hmm. some distribution compared in these two surveys, so maybe I will not say too much about that. And in the Western Pacific, uh, 
I cited the server's result is just selecting uh, some individual yes, but actually research in the Western Pacific uh, uh, continued and it was repeated in 2009-2010 in winter time in the open ocean, but for the Russian economic zone it's uh, conducted every year. And uh, actually, we cannot conclude that we have uh, some major shifts in summer distribution. And uh, we saw some evidences, and uh, mostly in the northeastern Pacific. And um, as you know, uh, maybe due to the direction of big currents in a big North Pacific gyres, all phenomena repeated in the Western North Pacific with some delay from the Northeastern North Pacific. So maybe we are still ex expecting these changes, but uh, did not observe it uh, today. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's it, Brian. Okay. Well, thank you, Vladimir. Obviously stimulated some interesting questions there itself. And uh, I think we have about four minutes before the schedule, but if we're ready to move on, we can certainly conserve time and um, get more questions later on if we want. And that, so, uh, Eugeny Kakabov from UBC is our next speaker. And if he is ready to go, it's my pleasure to introduce Eugeny, who's going to talk about exactly what we just had a question on salmon distributions in relation. The oceanographic observations. So we get Eugeny teed up and we can proceed. Again, thank you. Um, yeah, um, hello everyone. Um, where is my presentation? <laughs> okay, hello everyone. Um, Hello, can, can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, my presentation is entitled Oceanographic Conditions During the Gulf of Alaska 2019 and 2020 Expeditions. Uh, in this uh, uh, presentation, I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, contributions of Alexander Figurkin for the oceanographic portion of it. Brian Hunt and Natalie Mahara for the plankton part and Alexei Soma for the micronectin part. However, um, I am also acknowledging the entire teams uh, um, on board of 2019 and 2020 expeditions, which are listed on your right on, on the left, uh, right side, uh, who was um, at sea and responsible for the collection of the of this information. So uh, outline of today's uh, my presentation would be I will talk about the background very quickly and methodology, um, and then I will dive into the physical and chemical setting and biological setting where I will be talking about productivity, zooplankton, and micronectin. Um, one of the most important part of this is that uh, intercomparison between both surveys. So most of uh, of this presentation will be um, about 
uh, intercomparing uh, two two surveys to the large to the largest possible extent. You will see that it's not uh, that simple, but uh, I'll, I'll try my best. So, in order to uh, kind of place where the um, where the both surveys being conducted, you can see that they've been been done at the larger scale in the subarctic domain, and it's uh, Gulf of Alaska. Uh, two expeditions. This is the roughly the uh, contours of, of the both surveys. You can see that they only overlap quite heavily on the southern part. And while they are in the subarctic domain, uh, which is uh, I will call sometimes North, uh, North Pacific uh, uh, drift uh, domain, there is also in the southern part, there is a bifurcation between of, of the sub subarctic current into the Alaskan current, which then goes north along the coast and the Californian current, which is gold south. We, we almost not touched the, uh, uh, the uh, Californian current in both surveys. However, we did, uh, we did uh, just a little bit uh, touch uh, this current. So um, in order to put this in, uh, in a perspective, uh, this is the um, sea surface temperature anomalies from about 2013 to about 2021. <clears throat> which is showing the background on 2019 and 2020. Uh, first of all, you can also see that 2014, 2015, and 2016, those are the blob years, and there was a very warm uh, environment in the Gulf of Alaska. 2017 seemed to be uh, quite cool, or at least it was uh, more or less, more or less uh, close to normal. Although I, I'm not sure what the normal is, the 2017 and 2013 are similar. But if you will look into this 2019 and 2020 are also showing some warming happening in the northern and southern parts of the survey respectively. So those are probably not uh, uh, so much a normal years, but years which, uh, uh, which had some influence or were standing out of the nor normality uh, um, uh, compared to other years. Um, in terms of uh, sampling, uh, this is uh, two surveys. You can see that they are not really overlapping very much, but uh, the physical uh, and chemical oceanography was done using CTGs and uh, to different depths and different expeditions, 2019 down to 1,000 meters and uh, uh, 2020 down to 300 meters. Uh, for the first time, I will be presenting Bongo data down to 250 conducted uh, in both voyages. So this is the first time I will be presenting Bongo data. And I will also compare this to the micronectin midwater trolls, which were conducted, micronectin composition uh, roughly, uh, which were conducted in uh, top 30 meters. Below panels show you the surveys and uh, SST anomalies in the kind of zoomed in. What you can see here that in 2019, and this is probably one, uh, uh, one of big difference between two years, that the northern part have had been had uh, much more much stronger warmer anomalies while the southern part was actually cooler considering that this is uh, a, a warmer anomalies in the colder part of the survey and the negative anomalies or uh, negative anomalies in the warmer part of the survey it probably indicates that the gradients between those two were not very strong 2020 had a quite cool northern part which unfortunately wasn't sampled that that well and the uh, warmer uh, is southern part uh, compared to 2019. That's probably one of the major major difference uh, between those two. If we um, kind of summarize this, and this is uh, uh, left panels show you the differences between the sampling uh, surveys and the station positions, you can see that only a few stations were overlapping. So comparison is is limited. Uh, what first of all um, we can see that uh, 2020 survey was done almost uh, almost like, uh, like three three and a half weeks later, and this is the that's why we might be able to see the seasonal differences between two surveys. What we can say uh, uh, for the overall survey that 2019 was uh, um, was a, a little bit cooler than uh, 2020. 
uh, and uh, it, it, it really uh, uh, was uh, uh, quite uh, um, quite distinct north of the 52 north, which was much cooler in 2019, uh, while the uh, south of the 52 north, 2020 was actually warmer. So that's what we observed already in the surface temperatures. Whether or not it's related to uh, to the seasonality, maybe partially, but not not entirely, as you will see, as you can see a little bit later. Okay. 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 Um. My connection was lost. So uh, this panel uh, shows geostrophic currents down to 600 meters in 2019 in the top, uh, top uh, right panel and uh, 300 meters, um, uh, showing that the currents were mostly in, this, in, in the uh, eastern or eastern nor northeastern direction. Um, however, uh, in 20, um, 2020, you see, a slight, uh, you see the currents which are turning uh, turning south, which is uh, probably an um, indication of the uh, ca Californian current, and um, and uh, which uh, we do not see, or we probably uh, do not see this in 2019. That's also an indication that bifurcation zone might have been a little bit uh, further north. Uh, if you look into the surface temperatures, you can see that in 20, 2019 there were kind of vertical uh, vertical uh, um, or kind of um, latitudinal in the survey while in 2020 they were mostly uh, 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 longitudinal in 2019 and latitudinal in 2020. Um, however the uh, form or the surface temperatures were very similar slightly warmer in 2020 which was indicated by by other data. The same I don't know. I'm losing. I'm losing connection. This all the time. So please, can you move the slide? I will say now from now on next slide. Okay. Uh, surface salinity uh, was showing very similar patterns, um, and uh, uh, I will not really uh, talk about this next slide more. So if you look into the dissolved oxygen, um, it has a Again, a very similar patterns in both years, and the dissolved surface uh, dissolved oxygen was negatively correlated to the temperature, which is expected. And the critical oxygen depth was very deep. It was uh, more than uh, 250 meters in both years. It was a little bit deeper in uh, 2020, which probably an indication of the uh, seasonality. Here, yeah. next slide, please. Okay, now if we will look into the water masses and the water masses we observe in both years, all the water masses we we see in, in we see in um, in 2019 we observe them the same again in 2020. So we observe in the northern part we observe the Alaskan current which is a blue here in 2019. We observe this on our northeastern part of the survey 2020 and. Uh, the bulk of the um, of the survey was occupied by the subarctic water structure or north uh, north pacific drift uh, waters uh, in the southern part we observe um, mixed waters in 2019 and actually the uh, very highly transformed waters of the uh, subarctic structure um, you can see that uh, they are uh, they have similar similar physical uh, characteristics and uh, in 2020 they were slightly warmer compared to 2019 which is again probably the seasonal uh, seasonal uh, effect next slide please however uh, because of the limited survey during 2020 and also 2019 it's it's actually hard to understand what is happening so that's why we uh, reserved to the surface cards obtained using the OSCAR model, which takes into consideration 
um, the height and height, height anomalies, as well as wind and temperature. And uh, what we uh, what what is can be seen here in 2019 and 2020 is that we observe uh, a different uh, n a number of eddies. Uh, eddies were mostly uh, confined to the coastal region in 2019. There were uh, several of them. You can see even in, during this survey, we've seen several uh, cyclonic eddies and one anticyclonic eddies. However, in 2020, the number of eddies was higher. They both probably belong to high than Sitka eddies. And they were much more, uh, um, much more um, numerous in the central part of the survey. Next slide. Next. OK. Um, if we look into the picture slightly bigger, and this is where the difference between two surveys is coming from, we can observe that we, in both cases, we have seen coastal Alaskan currents in uh, along the coast and in the northward. Uh, we have a North Pacific drift waters, which are uh, in the blue here, and we have North Pacific and California current divergence water mass, which is a cyclonic. You can see that uh, the um, dynamics in 2020 is changed compared to 2019. If in 2019, in almost entire survey had been done in North Pacific drift waters, in 2020, we sampled actually all water masses, uh, major water masses uh, in, um, in the surveyed area. Next slide, please. So if I would add to the uh, physical uh, differences of physical background, I would say that 2020 compared to 2020, 2019, we had increased eddy generation or eddy genes. 2019 something was largely confined to cyclonic North Pacific drift domain, while 2020, uh, uh, albeit limited sampling, covered North Pacific drift, uh, um, coastal Alaskan current, and divergence between Alaskan and Californian currents. And what is interesting that the bifurcation zone seemed to be all the entire system shifted northward in 20 in 2020. So how this then affected the uh, biology? Next slide, please. I will not uh, say a lot about nutrients because we haven't analyzed 2020 nutrients. They are soon will be analyzed, but not yet analyzed. But um, there is a very strong separation. Uh, of the lower nutrient uh, content uh, of all uh, macronutrients in the southern part of the 2019 survey and, and much higher nutrient content in the northern part of the survey. Next, next slide, please. If we look into the surface chlorophyll, uh, it's patchy. And again, it's uh, hard to compare. However, however, if we look into the integrated uh, chlorophyll, which is uh, left panels, right panels. You can see that there are a few patches of a higher concentration uh, of this uh, of this uh, of the chlorophyll. They are quite often uh, restricted to the eddies, potentially eddies, um, but uh, it was uh, a definitely a higher concentration of chlorophyll in the southern part uh, during 2020. And that could be easily um, uh, uh, due to seasonality of our sampling. Next slide, please. Okay, um, I will not uh, look uh, into much of the details. What I can say that towards the 2019 survey in the southern part, we observed the development of the phytoplankton dream. We just catched this, caught this, while in 2020 it was already in a, in a, in a much more swing. There are the difference between those two years you can see that the mixed layer was actually going about uh, 80 to 90 down to about 80 to 90 meters and next slide would show you the distribution of the chlorophyll uh, vertical distribution in 2020 you can see that um, we observed this bloom which was had a high concentrations and the mixed layer uh, was extending about 10 to 15 meters on average uh, deeper compared to 2019. And this is again a seasonal, uh, very, very strong seasonal signal to this. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, um, I will not uh, really uh, talk a lot about the zooplankton community composition here in 2019 and 2020. Rather, I will talk about the size, size groups. 
but uh, a preliminary, uh, not preliminary, but actually analysis uh, uh, of the composition, species composition, and, and between two years in the comparable portion of the survey indicates that in 2019 was in, uh, um, uh, in 2020 rather than 2019 was a high contribution of the thousand species um, in the catches. Um, what the thousand species? It's a small uh, colonoid poppy pods, which uh, uh, which are much more abundant in the size fraction of uh, less than five uh, millimeters, and um, they are um, of the thousand origin. Next slide, please. So this slide shows you the zooplankton abundance, uh, bongo data, um, zooplankton abundance of the size different size fractions, less than five millimeters. 5 to 10 millimeters and more than 10 millimeters. And the bottom uh, right panel is the total zip length. You can see that it was, uh, uh, again, very strong, uh, very strong uh, pattern of the distribution. The thousand part had much higher concentrations of, uh, of, of uh, Mrs. Zooplankton of the 5 millimeter size fraction. And the northern part had much less concentration of this. And you can see that it's actually very, very strong difference um uh, it was uh, it however five to ten millimeters size uh, fraction uh, was more dominant in the northern part and uh, the same true for the more than 10 millimeters next slide please if we now look into the 2020 data we can see that uh, unfortunately we don't have a northern part but even for the comparable uh, uh, portion of this we we observe that the northern part of the survey between 2019, we had a, a lower concentration of uh, uh, or smaller size fraction, and the southern part where we had maximum concentration. The maximum actually remarkably in the same place. However, in this particular case, I won't won't be able to say what's happening in the northern part, but the southern part we've seen some high patches of uh, size fractions, five to ten and more than ten millimeters quite high. Next slide, please. Um, so the bottom line of this is that in 2019 and 2020, numerically, uh, there's a smaller size fraction, less than five millimeters. This is not the food for uh, salmon per se, but it's a food for the salmon prey, I would say. Uh, while uh, in terms of biomass, this uh, uh, this size fraction was contributing about 50 to 60 percent, and the size fraction of about 10 millimeters, which is representing the uh, potential food for salmon, adult salmon, was uh, quite quite significant. Anything between 35 to about 40 percent. But the bottom line, next slide. Uh, the bottom line is important to notice that uh, total zooplankton and micronectar biomass in both 2020 was about, on average, uh, about two times twofold higher than in 2019. And this ranged from about 1.5 to about almost threefold in the different years. And this is the kind of uh, showing you 2019 and 2020 two left panel of abundance and biomass. Please note that abundance is uh, logarithmic in the logarithmic scale, indicating that uh, they are about double uh, in 2020. Next slide. Micronectin biomass uh, presented here is showing that uh, the northern part in uh, 2019 was dominated by jellyfish, while the squid and mctophids were most abundant in the southern part. Next slide. And uh, more or less the same was observed uh, in, uh, in 2020, um, although um, jellyfish concentrations were much smaller. Let's now go to the next slide, um, where I will compare directly uh, total zooplankton uh, between 2019 and 2020. You can see that they are uh, remarkably similar. However, if you look into the um, uh, range, we're talking about at least on average double uh, biomass of uh, total zooplankton in 2020. And that comes across the all all, uh, all, all the size groups. If we put also on the bottom, uh, look at the bottom where there is a total micronectin uh, in 2019 and 2020, 
the northern part was dominated by uh, a total micromectan and it was quite high. So the same was uh, uh, maybe true, maybe not for uh, 2020. Next slide. A um, couple of things which I wanted to say uh, before I, I will wrap up is that in the northern part, we observed uh, uh, a lot of uh, jellyfish in 2019, and this is uh, this is a midwater trawl and visual observations on the upper uh, left uh, to to left panels, um, where the northern part was essentially packed with uh, uh, jellyfish, Chrysora melanaster. Uh, on uh, on the right side, there is a photo by say Somov showing how this, uh, uh, how many uh, jellyfish were observed at the surface. By the way, this is actually very interesting observation because we probably can do this uh, in the next future, take a photograph because it's easy to count them in, in the particular field. The southern part was dominated by the uh, by another gel gel gelatinous zooplankton, which was uh, counted uh, here and uh, uh, midwater trawl in, in, in in individuals per cubic meter and in kilograms per, uh, per square meter. And this is a Salpa aspera, which is thriving in the high chlorophyll concentrations. So what, uh, what, what it implies is that, uh, in fact, the northern part, which had a very low zooplankton concentration, was because, most likely, because of the predation by Chrysorum melanaster, because this is actually size class less than five millimeters, which is consumed by uh, by uh, by the species, mostly. Next slide. The last thing I wanted to bring into attention uh, is that uh, midwater trawl uh, 2020 was the same construction uh, constructed very similarly. However, it, it did have a three millimeter codent mesh insert, in it. and while we didn't catch any of those eats, which were a prominent uh, component of the of the fish diet. In 2019, in, in a trawl or very limited amounts, we've seen them in a Cassander, which is on the right side. In 2020, uh, FOZ catches in the open ocean were uh, quite were quite good, especially during the night time. I think this is something which we can adopt for the 2022 expedition very uh, very easily. Next slide, please. Okay, um, uh, just a summary uh, slide is that. 2019-2020 surveys were conducted in the transitional zone and encountered both subarctic and Alaskan currents. Next. Mean surface temperature were, uh, during 2020 was cooler than in 2019, and it was most pronounced in the northern part of the survey. Next. There was a strong north-south gradient of all oceanographic parameters, and surface 7 degrees is either term demarcated colder and warmer parts of surveys, both surveys. Next one. Uh, surface and integrated chlorophyll concentrations were patchy, indicative and indicative of phytoplankton plume development, bloom development in the southern part of both surveys in both years. And it was more advanced in 2020. Next. The plankton assemblage compositions indicated presence of southern species during 2020. Next one, last point. So plankton density was highest due, uh, was highest in the southern part of uh, of the uh, of the surveys. 2020 had uh, much higher concentrations of zooplankton, um, um, and uh, both uh, uh, zooplankton and non-gelatinous micronectin. The situation which we observed in 20, 2019 uh, was really um, uh, unique because we had a huge concentrations of uh, jellyfish in the northern part, and uh, it is I, I would like to hypothesize that in 2019 the feeding conditions for salmon and for the prey of salmon were uh, uh, much worse compared to 2020. 2020 was probably uh, I mean had a much better uh, foraging conditions for um, uh, first uh, juvenile salmon and uh, and uh, adult sign. Thank you. Sorry for taking this little bit longer. I was trying to capitalize on the previous savings.
Okay, well, thank you, Eugenie. Uh, I don't think we have much time for questions right now, unless there's a burning one there, Mark. Uh, if there's uh, not, no, we don't ask... have. Yeah, we haven't got anything. Eugenie, no. I think that you'll see later in the talks that the the catch distribution of fish was much more heterogeneous in 2020 than that. Do you want to comment? Was it because of the difference in the location to believe, or do you believe it was consistent with the heterogeneity you've seen in the zooplankton? Um, there's something which, uh, which is uh, interesting to point is that uh, we uh, didn't sample perhaps the most important food items of, uh, uh, of, uh, of salmon uh, by bongo nets and by a troll. So um, I think this is something which will have to be taken into very strong considerations in the future expeditions because we didn't catch, even in the bongo net, we didn't catch uh, uh, main prey of uh, salmonids. Um, and uh, we, in, in the same view, we also didn't catch uh, this uh, to very good numbers in um, in in the midwater trawl because there was something on the surface. Um, okay, I well, would say I'm that the heterogeneity, heterogeneity is, uh, is is important here, but it is very hard uh, for to conclude whether or not it was a driving force. All right, thank you. I think we need to move on to the next speaker, and that so lots to think about on that one. So our next speaker is Alexei Somanov. Alexei has been on both of our cruises and assisted Kristoff uh, as a <clears throat> chief scientist last year. And that, so I'll turn it over to you, Alexei, and great to see you again. Okay, hello, dear colleagues. Uh, I'm Alexey Somov, and I'm fishery biologist and work for Pacific Fisheries Research Center in Russia. And it is my pleasure to, and honor to give a talk at this conference. Mm. During this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, the techniques for estimating salmon abundance at sea, also, I would like to briefly start on catch results and abundance estimations for the two expeditions with some interpretation. Then I will discuss uh, the necessary steps to organize sufficient high seas monitoring. After that, I'm going to show some case studies that are used for some forecasting. And finally, I would like to give my own suggestions of possible survey design for some forecasting in the Gulf of Alaska. First of all, um, why do we use trolls as a main gear? Uh, there are several gears that to use in high seas research, such as gill nets, long lines, and trolls. Among others, trolls set a high demand to vessel capacity, so the vessel should be powerful enough to tow the trowel and have an appropriate winch. Uh, however, only trolls can give a non size selective data on salmon, and troll catches can be recalculated to relative and total abundance. Moreover, travel, trolls can provide the researchers with not only salmon abundances, but also with information on their biological surroundings. I mean, squids, mycophits, jellyfishes, and others just uh, uh, presented. Mm. Here I want to explain how we calculate relative and total abundance of Pacific salmon at sea. So first step is to compute relative abundance of salmon at each station using the formula in the red box. So numerator here is a catch and the denominator is the swept area multiplied by coefficients which we use in our, uh, in our routine, routine surveys. So second step is to calculate an average relative abundance for the whole study area. Uh, next is to obtain bias, errors, and confidence intervals for the for an estimated parameter, and we can apply a bootstrap approach for that. And finally, we multiply average relative abundance with confidence intervals by study area. Using such approach, we uh, calculated abundance for 2019 and for 2020 expeditions. So total abundance estimations look similar uh, and 
2019 we estimated 54.7 million fish while in 2020 it was uh, 51.1 million fish however for 2020 confidence interval was much greater than in 2019 it is probably related to patchy distribution of salmon in 2020 which was mentioned before uh, and uh, because we got two large samples in the very beginning of the survey with other ones were while other ones were re relatively small uh, in the picture below you can see that sample area in 2019 and 2020 differed so during 2020 we did not observe we didn't observe no the northern part of the Gulf of Alaska. Instead, we completed several trolls near shore. Anyway, we compared salmon abundance between two expeditions uh, within the shared area as well. So you can see the comparison results in the central column. Basically, total abundance estimations within shared areas did not differ severely, uh, with the exception of pink salmon, which was three times more abundant in 2020. Mm. Total salmon abundance within the shared area in 2019 was 40.4 million, and for 2000, I'm sorry, for 2019 it was 40.4 million fish, and for 2020, 46.6 million fish. Nevertheless, despite the total abundance, there are uh, clear differences in sp uh, special distribution of salmon so it was general a shift to the east in 2020 mm. in 2019 distribution of pacific salmon ha had a relative had a relatively even distribution while in 2020 salmon were found in local and local and comparably dense aggregation in the southeastern side of the survey area considering almost one month's difference between expeditions timing we assume that more patchy and aggregated distribution of salmon was the evidence of pre-spawning migrations of pink salmon and coho salmon speed migrations were uh, quite high and a good evidence of that was no catch as the repeated stations where, where initially we caught approximately 400 fishes so, uh, as Evgeny mentioned before, and uh, I want to emphasize it, that not only difference in survey timing, but also oceanological and weather condition could influence catchability and distribution of salmon. So, in 2019, almost whole the Gulf of Alaska was under positive sea surface, uh, temperature anomalies, and calm weather conditions. Uh, and in 2020, in contrast, only southern part of the Gulf of Alaska was warmer than the climatic norm. Uh, while the northern part of the Gulf of Alaska was mostly at the at an average level or slightly colder. Regarding weather conditions in the Gulf of Alaska in March 2020 was under constant cyclonic activity and it was it was expressed in high waves and strong wind which affected survey schedule. Mm, nevertheless, after two expeditions, we understood that catches were significantly lower than were expected. Uh, the historic uh, standardized data on salmon catch for 1956 to uh, 1996 suggests that in April, pink salmon and coho dwell at the southern boundary of the subarctic region, which uh, Vladimir Rachenko uh, mentioned in his pre presentation. This zone was below our station grid. And therefore, in our catches, we observed only northern periphery of coho and pink, uh, and pink winter and early spring distribution. Another evidence of high salmon concentrations beyond the study area was data on salmon shark migrations during uh, 2019 and 2020 year cycle. This data is kindly provided by Sabrina Garcia, who participated in 2020 expedition. So we can see the picture on the left. During its large-scale migration throughout the North Pacific, uh, sharks spent four months from January to April uh, at a particular area just west to our study, uh, study area. The reason why the sharks spent a long time at the same place might be feeding on abundant salmon aggregation there. So let's return to our historical data again. Uh, we understood that pink and coho inhabit areas south to our study grid. However, the historical data set proposes a high abundance of chum and sockeye within the study area. And initially, um, 
2019 expeditions was designed based on this data. So we expected high catches uh, of chum and sockeye there. In fact, we got much lower than potentially should, especially in terms of sockeye salmon. And another potential reason for that could be the blob. We, we speculate that blob in 2019 could cause the shift in salmon distribution. To check this, we built a model of salmon distribution during the winter using a set of oceanographic, oceanographic and biological covariates. As a response variable, we used available presence and absence data on salmon during the winter in North Pacific. Then we compared the potential distribution in March for an average multi-year data, uh, which is represented on upper panel, with those in March, in March 2019, which is a lower panel, and calculated the difference uh, between them. It is represented uh, in the middle panel. So the comparison suggests that sockeye and coho salmon shifted their distribution northwest, and for chum and pink salmon, such a shift was not observed according to the model. Uh, hence, although the model is just a very preliminary, it gives an evidence of blob affecting salmon distribution and uh, in some ways explains low catches, low catch rates of sockeye and high, high catch rates of coho during uh, 2019 and 2020 expeditions. Uh, here I want to finish with survey results and would like to discuss potential outcomes of high sea surveys. So I mean applying this data to forecasting. And the main idea is to predict a consequent return based on uh, catch data collected at sea. And despite the fact that high sea surveys are extremely expensive, that data collected at sea gives a relevant information on those fish. Period. And therefore, using this information in forecasting can used, reduce errors. To establish a highly efficient monitoring program with forecasting, uh, in my opinion, we need to first of all realize survey timing. So we need to know when to conduct a survey. Then we should know a specific area to observe. And it requires a clarification of, of my migration pathways. Uh, then we need to stock ID mixes, mixed salmon aggregation. And then in terms of species uh, spending more than one year at sea, we need to identify their age structure during, during their returns and maturation age proportion. Uh, to check the relationship between catches and returns, we need to collect a time series. We um, need to develop a complex model, which potentially could include not only catch, but also, uh, in, which, but also implies an environmental data. Next, I'm going to tell about some case studies where high seas data is used for forecasting. Uh, in Russia, pink, in the, pink salmon is the main salmon commercial species, and our high seas service aims to forecast pink salmon, which is comparably um, easy task. We conduct survey on salmon juveniles in fall in Bering and Ohotsk seas, and this data, this data provides uh, an expectation of pink salmon. Then, just several prior to fishing season, we carry out surveys on pre-spawning salmon moving towards spawning areas. We conduct such surveys in the early summer in the Bering Sea and the northwestern Pacific. Such surveys allow us to specify pink salmon returns and to assess winter mortality. And the relationship between abundance estimations at sea and returns is strong and significant for both uh, types of survey. The main issue during, during, the, during our surveys is to identify regional stocks composition, and it is especially crucial for the Hotsk Sea, as there are two major stocks, Western Kamchatka and Eastern Sakhalin, along with Kuril Islands. During the fall, Juvenile survey um, pink is stock ID by uh, genetic analysis, and also we use statistical clusterization techniques using an individual weight uh, of juveniles as a distinguishing parameter. 
Also during the summer survey, it is impossible to do genetics because of very short period between survey and fishing. And we have we just don't have time enough time to process the samples. In this case, we use only clusterization using gonadal somatic indexes because Western Kamchatka stocks mature earlier, and by the time of survey, their uh, gonadal somatic indexes are higher than those for Sahalin and Kuril stocks. And another very good case study is the Northern Bering Sea survey. Uh, data, data on juvenile catch is used to predict Canadian origin Yukon River, Chinook. This research is led by Jim Murphy, who will be presenting uh, a talk on day three. And I apologize in advance if I spoiled, I spoiled his presentation. Mm. So they developed a framework which allow to give a projections of Chinook returns for several years in advance. Framework includes total abundance estimations using bootstrap techniques, genetic stock ID to assess Canadian Chinook proportion, uh, and estimating return projections knowing the survival and maturation rates. So the develop, develop model explains 80% uh, of total variance of Chinook returns, and consequently, a given projections were quite precise and fitted real returns. Moreover, a high seas data from Northern Bering Sea surveys is also used to predict pink salmon returns to Yukon River and to the Norton Sound. The juvenile abundance index at sea explains 73% to year of year-to-year -year variability. Another case study is Southeastern Alaska. This survey designs uh, this survey design differs from previous studies. So in contrast to a large scale surveys, this program suggests multiple fishing along fixed transect in the icy strait. So icy strait is believed to be main offshore migration corridor for southeastern pink salmon. Uh, the survey lasts during the whole summer fall period and has been carried out for two decades already. The authors use a uh, peak catch per unit effort of pink salmon during the migration as a main predictor of consequent returns. Besides, icy strait temperature index is used as a covariate and final model explains 78 of uh, return variance. Uh, in Canada, the main effort of using and developing troll surveys to predict salmon returns was done by Richard Bimish with uh, colleagues. They have conducted multiple travel surveys in the Strait of Georgia for, for decades and have got a quite good relationship between juvenile cell, juvenile sockeye catches and their returns. Finally, I would like to discuss the possible ways of organizing a potential survey in order to forecast some returns in the Gulf of Alaska. So, as I mentioned before, to establish a survey to predict salmon, first and foremost, we need to understand where, where and the cruise. Again, to, to literature salmon in full grade the Alaskan and massively move by reaching the Aleutian Islands. In case of Sokai and Cham, they redistribute in northern and central Gulf of Alaska in winter. Uh, by late spring and summer, an immature portion of Cham and Sokai moves northwest toward the Bering Sea for feeding, while maturing portion approaches spawning grounds and Canadian stocks consequently move eastward. In terms of pink and coho, after reaching the Aleutian Islands, just like and Sakai do. However, after offshore migration, pink and, pink and coho migrate eastward sticking to the southern boundary of the subarctic area. And by spring, they concentrate in the southern and southeastern uh, part of the Gulf of Alaska. And by the end of spring, they start moving northeast toward the shore. I guess we detected such situation in 2020 expedition. Mm. So having this approximate migration pattern and timing, I think that uh, two possibly survey designs are uh, mm, can be applied to forecast uh, salmon. So first option is to organize a full survey within shelf when juveniles migrate along the Alaskan stream. In this case, survey design might be similar to that uh, United States colleagues 
apply for IC straight. So it, um, it must be several transects uh, that should be surveyed during the whole summer fall period. In this regard, it is worth referring to Canadian high seas monitoring program, which have been carried out for 14 years between 1995 and 2008. During this period, a multiple surveys were done in various seasons. The main object ob objectives of these surveys were to collect information on the distribution and ecology of Pacific salmon during their ocean phase. However, I did not find the published papers on the attempts to use this data for salmon forecasting. Probably such analysis would provide an evidence that full juvenile survey can be used for forecasting. And finally, another option is to organize a high seas life scale survey during late spring and early summer to estimate an abundance of mature salmon migrating uh, shoreward. So such a survey would be an analog of Russian survey in, in the Northwestern Pacific. So of course, these suggestions based upon data collected more than 30 years ago and current situation on salmon winter distribution and migrations may severely differ. So in that perspective, the 2022 Pan-Pacific expedition could, could update and deepen our knowledge of winter salmon ecology, which is crucial to understand further steps towards salmon high seas monitoring in the Gulf of Alaska. Thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you, sir. Not provoking. You're welcome. Mark, we have some time for questions. Uh, I see we don't have the next one scheduled till seven, so we actually have about 15 minutes, 14 minutes right now. Okay, okay I will do um, my best to answer the question. <laughs> we haven't got any questions uh, as of yet, uh, Alexi, but um, I will ask one. That, that was a, a unbelievably good talk. Uh, you covered so much ground there. Uh, with a lot of information for us to think about in terms of 2022 and uh, expedition and beyond. Um, kind of a simple one, I guess, related to the calculation of the, the biomass estimates. Um, you know, the oceanography showed that in 2020 we were in sort of multiple um, uh, water bodies. And uh, is it possible, did you give any thought to stratifying uh, the biomass calculation rather than uh, to, to stratify it by the, either some of those, uh, the water bodies, rather than expanding uh, over the entire, the average over the entire uh, area. Mm, I would like to, um, to make such calculations, but uh, unfortunately, I don't have uh, oceanographic data. So I mean, in terms of dividing the, the whole area on uh, mm -hmm. particular water masses. So if we we can we can do it in future. So. Great. Are there others with uh, questions for Alexi out there? Okay. Well, if we've got a gap again, let me ask Alexi a question. Uh, I was interested in the months you chose in your proposal for a uh, forecasting survey. And that May, June would be very, very tight for processing of information unless we did real time DNA analysis at sea, potentially. Um, and then we would have to get the information into the management system on that. So is there a reason that you chose May, June or is that sort of very much aligned to the timing for Russia? Yeah, I see the problem because we have absolutely the same pro uh, problem in our survey in the North Western Pacific. Fortunately, we have two major stocks, which is quite, which are quite huge. So in terms of Gulf of Alaska, with its multiple position, uh, it would be a real challenge to understand and, and do it quickly. So probably uh, progress in the genetic analysis, like Christoph Dick uh, have done in uh, 2019 expedition aboard the vessel, probably it would be a a way to um, quickly process the genetic samples and provide uh, theory with uh, such information. So, I mean, 
carried by uh, different stocks. Uh, Alexei, we do have a question here from uh, Lori Whitecamp. Uh, in Russian forecasts, do you consider the condition of fish, example, condition factor or size, other than gonad index to distinguish stocks? So, um, as I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned in my uh, in my talk, so when we conduct whole survey, we use uh, weight as a pre as a distinguish. It, it is possible to use a condition factor to, of uh, juveniles to, uh, to understand the proportion of northern and southern uh, regional stocks. But for uh, in terms of pre-spawning fish. Uh, it is more useful and gives uh, better results to use uh, GONAD index. Mm -hmm. Nothing else? Mark, if there's no uh -huh. other questions... Mark, yeah, that's, it's all quiet, Brian. Yep. Well, we have about 10 minutes. We've been on here for almost two hours. I'm just thinking maybe we should just take a, a quick 10-minute break and just stay connected. And we'll come back with uh, Dr. Costa talking about the satellite uh, chlorophyll measurements. I, I did have so, one okay. question that just came in, Brian. No. You have one? Go ahead. Got one. Yeah, I just came on uh, from uh, Uralasan. Um Juvenile survey, uh, juvenile salmon, oh, sorry, thank you. Juvenile salmon survey in the Okhot Sea is important for Asian salmon. Do you use the catch data only for the forecast of pink salmon? Pink salmon. There are some. Uh, 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 to forecast the species. Sokai and it requires uh, a framework like uh, United States College did. So it's much complicated in comparison to pink salmon. So uh, a few questions coming in now. Everybody's uh, everybody's livening up here. Uh, so Nobody from Jim Murphy. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Jim Murphy's uh, asking, uh, commenting, excellent job, Alexi. Uh, I was wondering if you would consider surveys earlier, earlier in the year, like April, would work well for forecasting. Yeah, probably. We just need to identify uh, time. So we, I just so suggestions based mostly on previously collected data which was uh, obtained 30 years ago. So probably situations ha situation has changed by now. So we've got uh, another one from uh, Jackie King. The implementation of electronic data acquisition systems for collection of catch and biological data would help take the results from a May-June survey along with a rapid uh, genetic stock ID result to provide a fast turnaround for forecasting. Mm, so I agree it sounds more like a suggestion, not, not as a question. So probably, yeah. You're right. There, there is no question mark on it, so you're right. Yeah. Okay, well, that's uh, it's all quiet again, Brian. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to suggest we take a quick break because my voice is going for some reason. <clears throat> and we will start promptly at 7 o'clock with uh, Dr. Costa.
Well, welcome back. Our next speaker, I'm not sure who's speaking. Uh, I just had a different name, but I think Dr. Mycera Costa has been a <clears throat> co-worker in the Sailor Sea research we've been doing for over a decade. And she was a participant, or her student was, on the 2019 cruise. So we look forward to hearing her presentation. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm waiting for the presentation to show up. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vishnu P.S. Uh, today, I will be talking about the phytoplankton dynamics from the 2019 and 2020 Gulf of Alaska expedition. Next slide, please. So the outline for this today's presentation consists of the goal of the presentation and does what are the samples collected from the two expedition. And I will be talking about the results. In results, I will be talking about remote sensing reflectance collected from the 2019 expedition comparison with in situ versus satellite and satellite chlorophyll retrieval and the latitudinal trend of chlorophyll concentration and uh, pigments to total chlorophyll ratio from the expeditions and uh, chemtax derived pft chlorophyll concentration uh, for the two expedition also i'll be showing the phytoplankton groups retrieved from the hyperspectral and satellite data next slide please so the goal of this project is to define the surface phytoplankton dynamics in the gulf of alaska so how do we define the surface phytoplankton dynamics in the Gulf of Alaska is by looking at uh, satellite based chlorophyll concentration and also the phytoplankton community composition also derived from the satellites. Here what you are looking at is a Sentinel-3 image. Sentinel-3 is a European Space Agency satellite and this image is acquired during the expedition of 2020 for the specific for the day of 23rd March. Next slide, please. So what are the samples collected during the 2019 and 2020 expeditions? So, so we have collected above water remote sensing reflectance from 2019 and all other some all other available such as HPLC data and microscopy and Sentinel-3 acquired during the both expeditions. On the right side, you are seeing the steady area and the water samples collected uh, from the two expeditions. From 2019, the samples, the timing of the expedition is between February and March. And for 2020, the timing was entirely March. Next slide, please. So here, what you're looking at is remote sensing reflectance collected from the different locations of 2019 expeditions. So the remote sensing reflectance spectra show a typical case one water remote sensing reflectance spectra with maximum absorb maximum reflectance in the blue and is decreasing towards the longer wavelength especially towards the in the red and near infrared and including a you can see a fluorescent peak at 680 nanometer which actually indicates the chlorophyll so this remote sensing reflectance spectra shows waters that have low dissolved organic matter and inorganic suspended particles next slide please so here what you're looking at is a comparison between in-situ remote in-situ collector remote sensing reflectance uh, which is showing on the left side and the satellite acquired remote sensing reflectance which is on the right side here you can see that the in-situ and satellite remote sensing reflectance are in similar spectral shape and also the satellite acquired remote sensing this dynamic range of satellite remote sensing reflectance are showing a similar dynamic range with the in situ which indicates a good atmospheric which indicates a good atmospheric correction so uh, at the end we will be using this in situ acquired remote sensing reflectance and the satellite acquired remote sensing reflectance to derive the different phytoplankton groups uh, next slide please 
so this so the, these plots are showing the chlorophyll a validation of 2019 and 2020 separate and both shows a very robust statistics for the retrieval of chlorophyll a compared to the in-situ data so when we combine the in-situ when we combine the 2019 and 2020 we can see that the statistics is reduced a little bit that's mainly due to the lower concentration from 2020 so overall we can see that there is a good agreement between in situ chlorophyll and satellite chlorophyll a can i see the next slide next slide please so now i evaluated the chlorophyll a retrieval chlorophyll a retrieval from the chlorophyll a retrieval from the uh, from uh, from the matchup so now we can start now we can do the analysis of chlorophyll dynamics from the sentinel 3 image here i have shown the latitudinal trend of chlorophyll from 2019 which you show which you are seeing on the upper plot and the lower one is the latitudinal trend of chlorophyll from 2020 so the chlorophyll product from sentinel 3 usually shows a general pattern uh, for this time of the year where you can see that in the in the first week of the in, you can see in the week of 26 feb 26 february 2019 to the 5th march 5th march 2019 where you can see that the chlorophyll concentration in the central part of the alaska ranges from 0.4 to 0.5 milligram per meter cube and the chlorophyll is tend to increase towards the northern and eastern shelf a similar pattern was observed for the 2020 especially you can see that the central region which is highlighted in the blue color which is actually the the chlorophyll ranges for that for the chlorophyll ranges ranges from 0.4 to 0.5 milligram per meter cube and it's only started to increase towards the northern eastern shelf next slide please so um here what you're looking at is accessory pigments to total chlorophyll ratio for 2019 and 2020 so here we can see that what are the dominant pigments and we this dominant and this pigment indicates is actually a proxy for what are the phytoplankton present in the water so here we can see that if you look at the 2019 act 2019 figure which is in the upper one so where you can see that the green color which is actually the pigment 19 hf which is actually a diagnostic pigment for haptophytes and followed by we can see that the yellow one indicates the related contribution of uh, focosanthin and the brown one indicate the 19 bf the 19 bf is actually a proxy for pelagophytes also we have uh, also we have chlorophyll b from 2019 which is a uh, diagnostic pigment for uh, green algae uh, similarly from the 2019 the bottom one we have equal contribution the relative contribution of 1919 hf and uh, uh, focosanthin especially apart from these two pigments we can also start to see the relative contribution of peridine in 2020 which is actually a, a diagnostic pigment for dinoflagellate so so uh, so basically uh, the pigment indicating as that haptophytes are the dominant phytoplankton groups from 2019 and 2020 can i see the next slide so uh, similar to the hplc data this is a chemtax derived phytoplankton community composition for 2019 and 2020 here what you are seeing the chemtax is also telling us that haptophytes are the dominant phytoplankton groups in 2019 followed by pelagophyceae and the green algae a similar pattern was observed 2020 apart from the haptophytes and green algae we can start to see some uh, diatom especially in the coastal region uh, if you look at the station the bottom one is for the 2020 if you look at the station especially 21 23 and 24 uh, station we can see high concentration of uh, diatom and green algae and even dinoflagellate so i so i, I highlighted uh, uh, those stations even the left to bottom were in the uh, yellow side yellow circle so those are the stations very close to the continental shelf so those regions is dominated by high concentrations of diatom can i see the next slide so now we understand what are the dominant phytoplankton groups 
from the chemtech. So now we developed an empirical orthogonal function model based on the hyperspectral RRS and remote sensing reflectance and satellite acquired remote sensing ref reflectance to retrieve different phytoplankton uh, groups, different phytoplankton groups. Here we developed uh, this model based on chemtax, a PFT, chlorophyll concentration, and the corresponding in situ RRS from the satellite and hyperspectral. Once we develop this model, we evaluate the model based on machine learning technique. Once we evaluate this model, we apply this model to a satellite image to retrieve different phytoplankton groups from the satellite pixel. Can I see the next slide, please? So here what you are seeing is a regression between chemtax derived PFT on the x-axis and the corresponding PFT chlorophyll concentration retrieved from the hyperspectral RRS of the 2090. So if you look at these two, uh, um, two red box, which is showing in the lower part, uh, the left one is indicating haptophytes and the right one is for pelago. So we can see that there is a good agreement between the absorbed and the predicted chlorophyll concentration for haptophytes and pelagophysia and uh, the top left is for green algae. So the chemtax is telling us that uh, haptophytes are the dominant phytoplankton groups for the 2019. So the hyperspectral based to EOF model, empirical orthogonal functional model, also shows a good retrieval for the dominant groups such as haptophytes followed by pelagophysia and green algae. Can I see the next slide? So, the, okay, now what you're seeing is the phytoplankton groups retrieved from the Sentinel-3 for the 2019 and 2020. Here, the results is also telling us that the EOF based model developed from the satellite also telling us that uh, haptophytes, the, the, hap the observed and the predicted chlorophyll concentration of haptophytes is showing a good agreement and similar with the green algae and cryptophytes and pelagophysia. So here, apart from the hyperspectral, we can see that there is a slight slight decrease in the performance of the model. This is because the in in multispectral satellite we have only limited number of uh, limited number of bands. So that's why we have the uh, we have the uh, performance is slightly reduced here. But even though we can see that the EOF based satellite based model also showed a good retrieval for the dominant phytoplankton groups. Can I see the next slide? So now I evaluate the performance of the PFT derived from satellite and hyperspectral. So now I'm going to apply the satellite based model to an individual satellite image to to make. Uh, to make a map of spatial to make the spatial distribution of different phytoplankton groups here what you're looking at is uh, the spatial distribution of the chlorophyll concentration of different phytoplankton groups derived uh, from the satellite image for the for the 2019 exp expedition specifically for the week of 18 february to 25 february 2019 if you look at this if you look at this spatial distribution of phytoplankton for this particular week especially the green the haptophytes and green algae which is shown on the top left we can see that the haptophyte related concentration was high compared to the high other phytoplankton such as cryptophytes dinoflagellates and diatom and the chemtax is the 2019 chemtax result also telling us that uh, haptophytes are the dominant one um, dominant one and uh, however cryptophytes the chlorophyll concentration of cryptophytes dinoflagellates and diatom are show the lower lower values a similar pattern was observed for the week of 6th march to 13 march where we can see that uh, which is uh, where we can see that haptophytes are the dominant phytoplankton groups followed by green algae and the cryptophytes uh, show the lowest chlorophyll concentration can i see the next slide please so what is happening in 2020 this is the um, uh, um, pft spatial map for the 2020 here uh, for the specific week of uh, from Mar 5th of march 2020 to 12th march 2020 which is that which pl that plot shown on the top left top right uh, top left so here we can see that again we can see that haptophytes actually dominating their relative con concentr the relative contribution of the concentration of haptophytes is dominating in, even in 2020 followed by green algae and but 
in the shelf waters we are started to see some high concentration of all all pfds for example green algae and diatom and dinosaur if you look at this shelf region we can see that yellowish orange color that indicates the high concentration so in the shelf waters we can see all phytoplankton tend to increase and if you look at the chem tax which is shown in the um, bottom left where we can see that especially for the station 21 22 and 23 stations where we can see high concentrations of diatom green algae and dinoflagellates so as the similar observation was observed for the week of 21 march to 28 march where haptophytes is dominating followed by green algae and all phytoplankton is increasing towards the shelf region so can i see the next slide please so now i am trying to summarize the outcome of this project into methods and validation and the surface phytoplankton surface phytoplankton dynamics even in the methods and validation the remote sensing reflect and shows a typical case one water with the low concentrations of dissolved organic material and total inorganic particles and low phytoplankton the, the sentinel 3 remote sensing reflectance with comparison with in situ shows a good atmospheric corrections and uh, the chlorophyll from the sentinel and the satellite showed a satellite are in a good agreement the accessory pigments to total chlorophyll ratio and chem tax results indicating us that haptophytes pelagophytes and green algae are the dominant phytoplankton groups from 2019 and 2020 the e empirical orthogonal function uh, retrieved, retrieved from the hyperspectral sat satellite hyperspectral data also showing a good retrieval for the dominant groups especially for haptophytes pelagophytes and green algae the EOF model from retrieved from the Sentinel-3 also indicates that haptophyte uh, also showed a good retrieval for the dominant groups. And the surface phytoplankton dynamics shows the central region shows a low concentration, chlorophyll concentration with ranges from 0.25 to 0.5 milligram per meter cube. And the, the PFT dist distribution from 2019 and 2020 shows the open ocean chlorophyll concentration ranges from 0.01 to 0.6 milligram per meter cube. And hap haptophytes are the dom highest, haptophytes show the highest chlorophyll concentrations. And cryptophytes show the lowest cryptophytes and, and that shows the lowest concentration from the two expedition. Also, we can see that all phytoplankton, especially diatom, show high concentration uh, and shows a higher chlorophyll concentration, especially in the shelf waters. Um, next slide, please. And thank you. If you have any questions, you can feel free to ask me or you can email me. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vishu. Well, that was a mouthful, eh? <laughs> yeah. A lot of material to take in there. Yeah. And that, so, you got any questions on that side, Mark? No, I'm not seeing anything uh, coming out of the audience yet. Um, so, I, I guess, Vishu, Vishu I think. I, oh, go ahead, Brian. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. That's yeah, fine. Yeah, no, so Vishnu, I, I seeing that um, I'm not a uh, an oceanographer by yeah. any stretch, um, but it seems like you're um, it's a, a success in terms of being able to ground truth what um, we're seeing from from the satellites. Um, and what you've seen from the other work, do you see uh, any connections between um, the what you're seeing in the um, the phytoplankton? Uh, distribution in relation to the um, to the work that the to the to the zooplankton. So, is there any way in your work to you see looking at those connections? Actually, I haven't looked at the, the I mean the I mean the comparison of maybe the phytoplankton and zooplankton link. Actually, I haven't done that yet. So basically, I focused mostly on the phytoplankton distributions. Yeah, maybe maybe later, maybe we can actually have a look into that, how these phytoplankton and zooplankton are connected and what are the link between, you know, these two. So, um, I guess, uh, Brian, in a second here, but um, so with this ground truth thing, is there more work to be done in terms of at sea collection or is your work done now? We can simply utilize the satellite imagery uh, to guide our, our, our work going forward. Can so I? Can you guys hear me? No. Yes, we can. Yeah, yep. yeah, we. I, yep. I just want to address the previous question. Sorry about interrupting, Vishnu. Uh, so, yeah, okay. uh, 
Yeah, so, uh, you know, just because I have a better overview of the project, right? So this is Vishnu's PhD thesis, part of his thesis, actually, just one part of it. So uh, in terms of coupling the phytoplankton and the zooplankton, that's something that we definitely want to do in hopefully in collaboration with uh, Brian Hunt and uh, Eugene, right? In terms of uh, the, the work that they're doing, right? And uh, and uh, and uh, in, a, in a large scale, I think there's many more link that can be done with this data, even when, uh, you know, our colleagues from, from Ashi was just presenting uh, some of his results and I was just starting to think about how can you put all the spatial component of uh, all the data that we analyze into that. That will be tremendous, right? So I think that's one important thing about this meeting is to start to to, to brainstorm how can we link all the information that other people are putting together to to tell a better story uh, of the dynamic of the region. So yes, so we're, we're definitely going to be looking to that and the, not necessarily Vishnu will be doing that uh, as part of his PhD, but it's something that hopefully will come up with, uh, you know, the, the, the next stage of postdocs with, uh, you know, Brian and, and other people in, in, in the working team, right? Yeah. So, uh, and, uh, you know, if I can introduce just uh, to start to answer the next question, yes, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think Bra uh, Vishnu showed excellent results and, uh, you know, these are excellent results for retrieval of chlorophyll and, and uh, phytoplankton groups from satellite. We know that based on other regions of the world, right? So we're absolutely pleased and, uh, to be honest, quite surprised with the quality of results that were obtained. Uh, but said that, the, the number of samples that we have is very limited. Right, so the models are working quite well for that limit set of samples. So increasing the number of samples can make it more massy, or can make it more robust. Right, but it will would definitely allows us to address uncertainties much better. Right, so we have a, a, a little bit of uncertainty on the lower range of chlorophyll concentration. Uh, can we address this better if we have a large sample size? So the idea of the cruise in 2020, in which hopefully we have more HPLC data for the entire region, this can be all put together into the model to address better, uh, to, to better know uncertainties of the model, right? So we can talk with more, uh, from, we can produce products that are more clear and more accurate, right? But Vishnu, if you have anything else to add, please do so. I think that's, uh, you, you actually highlighted all the all the important things, I think. Yeah, uh, maybe my Sira, like, so especially if you look at the, the retrieval for the model, especially in the shelf waters, where we can see that the uncertainty, because that, because that mainly because we don't have much data from the shelf waters. Most of our data is actually from the central region. So if you have maybe have more data, then you will actually tune your model with this, you know, the number of more number of data points that definitely may improve the quality of the retrieval. Yes. So yeah, I'll, in the in the in, in the zooplankton zooplankton component, we are actually doing this uh, for the Salish Sea, right? So Brian may be aware of it. So we're looking into uh, the work that Karen Suchi is almost finished for publishing, uh, is looking at this coupling of uh, uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton for the Salish Sea. But all of this, at the end of the day. It all depends on your samples, right? So there's, it's so limited, especially for zooplankton samples, right? For anywhere, imagining the uh, Gulf of Alaska, right? So our time series becoming very limited at the end because of the, 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 the low number of uh, of samples. But I'll, I'll leave it yeah. like this. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Ms. Sarah. Thank you, Vishnu. Uh, we do have some questions come in. Um, a, a Brian, so I think there's probably a couple of Brian's out there. I'm guessing this is Brian Hunt. Uh, thanks, Vishnu. Do you intend to relate surface measured chlorophyll A data and depth integrated chlorophyll A? So for now, we have only um, surface chlorophyll A concentration and uh, we don't have the vertical profile. Uh, but I, I think uh, Brian. I have this fluorescence data from the CDD and we can actually do a comparison, see how this fluorescence derived chlorophyll concentration and the HPLC is actually uh, comparing with the HPLC. And 
yeah uh, i think uh, uh, so basically even from the satellite satellites also giving the upper uh, the upper the surface chlorophyll concentrations right and uh, we have only uh, even from the hplc we have only uh, surface chlorophyll concentrations so uh, yeah Okay. Yeah. Um, a, a question from Gennady, actually, too. Uh, what big scale oceanographic patterns <clears throat> are deriving or confirming from you, from uh, remote uh, using remote d uh, data in 2019 and 20? And a second question about what would be the main goal for the 2022 expedition regarding remote sensing data? So so maybe I'll one. talk about that, especially because of the 2022, because uh, Vishnu, as I said, right, so I'm, I'm kind of mm. coordinating the project. So uh, so the patterns, uh, so right now, uh, things are slightly static uh, to, to answer your question, because we are doing an analysis that is related to the period in which the, the 2020 and 2019 expedition occur, right? So those are kind of months snapshots right so it doesn't really give us this, this time scale framework that allows us to talk about large scale dynamic yeah. however from the from the from that time in which data was acquired right that uh, we validate everything so we can see what the generally speaking the literature show the low concentrations and the increasing concentration towards the north and the east part of the region right so uh, but now we have this on a kind of a spatial domain, right? It's not just punctual data. And the PFTs is actually quite interesting because it's the first time that the phytoplankton dominant groups are derived for this region uh, at a spatial scale, uh, because we can do that with the satellite. So uh, the phytoplankton that occur there, they they are already publishing the literature, but now we have a spatial distribution of these, which is quite interesting. So you see how homogeneous some of those areas are, especially in the central part of the Gulf of Alaska. For the 2020 expedition, uh, one of the things that we're trying to take into consideration is not to see the expedition as just one expedition, right? So as part of the 2020 expedition project, we're trying to add this time scale on the analysis. So we're going to go back in time, hopefully to the 80s and all the way to the present and, and try to analyze for a much larger spatial scale uh, the, the, the variability in the area in regard to chlorophyll dynamics and phytoplankton functional types and uh, other variables that can be driving these dynamics. So we're going to look at sea surface temperatures, whatever data we can derive from satellite platforms. But to do that, to build, to go back in time, in this time scale, we, we do have to have more data that represents this entire region so we can actually improve the model that Vishnu uh, developed. Right? So it's an important first step is giving us a lot, but the better data we have, the better the model is going to behave, uh, generally speaking. I don't know if I answer your question, but uh, one of the main goals for us for the expedition itself is increase our database of HPLC data so we can make a more robust association with the satellite reflectance. Uh, maybe <clears throat> for some of us that aren't familiar, can you explain what HPLC is, uh, Masira? Oh, it's uh, it's the high precision. It's a it's a standard method to uh, to define concentration of pigments in phytoplankton. So instead of uh, measuring just chlorophyll A concentration, which mm -hmm. all the phytoplanktons have, it does measure other pigments such as the one that Vishnu mentions in his presentation, which are marker pigments for different phytoplankton groups. Right, so uh, so if we have the marker pigments of the different phytoplankton groups, we can improve uh, this Chemtex library that we are building right now, which allows us to go from phytoplankton group, phytoplankton pigments to phytoplankton groups, because that's what uh, okay. uh, what's needed yeah. for the satellite. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> last right. question here from Alexi. Um, Great job, Vishnu. Is it possible to understand a relationship between chlorophyll A and zooplankton abundance and time lag between peaks of phytoplankton and zooplankton blooms? 
Yes. Uh, so at the moment, we we don't we haven't looked into that, but I think it's possibly that's an option to look into that. Maybe the collaboration because we have the HPLC data and phytoplankton dynamics data. Other colleagues have this soup plankton. And I think it's possible to have take a look into that and what is the relationship between and the chlorophyll uh, dynamics and soup plankton dynamics. I think it's possible to look into that. I think yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Brian, I don't know how our time is, but uh, that's well, all the questions we have right now. Yeah. Great. Well, I think we are right on time. We do have a break now because we have one talk that couldn't be provided and that. And so we will have a half hour break before the next scheduled talk. Uh, Monsieur, I just wanted to add before we break that if there are specific experiments that should be conducted while we're out in the Gulf of Alaska, uh, for example, the gill netter that we'll take out will largely be fishing at night and so could actually conduct various experiments for you during the day. So I think instead of just comparing a collection of observations, maybe we need to actually start explicitly designing studies that could be executed while we're on the sea. And that, so I'll just leave that with you as an opportunity. And that, okay. okay. Yeah, I do have an email to send to Jackie this week with, uh, you know, what else we need to do, what else yeah, they need sure. to do when they're in the sea. There's a little bit of a limitation for the 2020 that, uh, you know, it's the DFO cruise is going to be the DFO cruise, right? But we can, yeah, hopefully we can all work together towards get as much data as possible, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, okay. uh, yeah, okay. no, I well, think it's, uh, it's, it's tremendous. Thanks a lot, Brian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's take the uh, time to maybe get something to eat in the evening uh, here or the morning in Russia. And that uh, we will start again at 8 o'clock, and Dr. Terry Beecham will be addressing some of the uh, genetic basis for stock identification. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much for your yeah, you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you.
So this evening, I'm going to be talking about uh, genetic baselines, uh, types of uh, genetic markers, and how you would do uh, mixed stock analysis using genetic stock identification. Next slide, please. So I, I'm going to be talking a lot about uh, microsatellites and single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. So I, I thought I'd just start with outlining what microsatellites and SNPs are. So microsatellites are, are tandem repeats, usually two or four base pairs. And SNPs are, are uh, point mutations in, the, uh, in, in specific spots in the genome. So the, the alleles are the same size, they just differ by sequence. Next slide, please. It's a collection of, of tandemly repeated sequences. Here we have a, a two base pair repeat, so you can see the, the AT is the repeating sequence. Next slide. So microsatellites differ in length. So you can have different numbers of, of the tandem repeats sort of uh, glued all to, to, together. So they, they differ in size. Next slide. A SNP is a, is a mutation right in a specific point in the genome of, of, an, of an individual. So it, all, all SNPs, so there, there's no size variation. It's just uh, differences in the uh, base pair sequences. Next slide. So in the old days, we used to score SNPs by um, fluorescent probes. Now we score them by uh, directly sequencing the uh, DNA of an individual. Next slide. So stock identification, we need a, a baseline and we need mixed stock samples. So we have a baseline of populations that we apply to estimate a stock composition. And then the more complete the baseline we have, the better the stock identification results will, will generally be. So typically when you're using genetic stock identification, you need to have some genetic differentiation among the populations in the baseline. So you can estimate a stock composition in the fishery sample. Next slide. All right, so what do you do to estimate a stock composition is you, you, you go out to the spawning grounds and, and you collect some, uh, uh, some tissue samples and you can subsequently genotype those in individuals. And then you need uh, mixture data from mixed stock fishery and that's where you have an unknown uh, stock composition and that's what you're trying to estimate. Next slide. So, so basically how mixed stock analysis works is that you, you generate the baseline populations, you, you look at the differences in, uh, in allele frequencies of, of, of various markers. Then we use some software to estimate what the most likely composition of that, of that specific mixture is. Okay, so next slide. All right, so what, what, I'm, what I'm going to, to, to do here is to run through um, what baselines are available for um, the, the various species of, of salmon. So for uh, chum salmon, we have microsatellites and SNP baselines uh, that are available. There's a, a Pacific Rim baseline that's available for both uh, microsatellites and SNPs, there are also some uh, regional uh, baselines that are available. So we've got uh, quite good coverage on, on a Pacific Rim basis for both microsatellites and SNPs. Um, so either uh, class of genetic markers could be used to estimate a stock composition. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk about the status of the baselines in our laboratory but also in, include uh, comments uh, as, far, as far as I know on, on the status of, of uh, other baselines that are available. 
for for SNPs for Chung Salmon, there was a, a PAC SNP uh, baseline that was that was developed. Uh, it had a, a Pacific Rim application, but uh, the the numbers of SNPs were limited, so it's not really used a, a lot much any, anymore. The baseline that we developed has been applied to the uh, 2019 and 2020 Gulf of Alaska cruises. It, it, it has a fairly good representation. Next slide. This is what we have in our, uh, our Chum SNP baseline. We have, uh, we use uh, about 545 of, of these SNPs, these genetic markers. We've uh, surveyed about 400 populations, 32,000 individuals, and we report stock compositions to 68 reporting units. You can see on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, there's are the number of reporting units that that we use in in Canada we have these down to what we call uh, conservation units next slide for sockeye salmon we have both um, microsatellite baselines and SNP baselines that are available um, the the microsatellite baseline has Quite good coverage, and and that is can be easily applied to um, unknown samples from from the Pacific Ocean. We're working on our uh, on our SNP baseline, so it's not quite operational yet. There are SNP uh, baselines available uh, through more regional baselines that are available through uh, probably the, the Alaska Department of uh, Fish and Game. I don't believe that they have a, a Pacific Rim baseline that's ready to go at, at this stage. We have been applying our microsatellite baseline to estimate the stock compositions of, of uh, sockeye salmon that have been caught in the, uh, in the summer uh, Bering Sea cruises by Japan. Next slide. For Chinook salmon, there are both microsatellite and SNPs baselines available. Um, there are a number of regional uh, microsatellite baselines available. Uh, I believe we, we probably have some uh, Russian baselines. Uh, we certainly have a few North American baselines. For, for our own lab, we have a fairly good coverage uh, uh, on a Pacific Rim basis, except for Western and Central Alaska. In Western Alaska, we, we have very good coverage of, of the Yukon, but outside of the Yukon, it's quite, it's, it's lacking considerably. Now, we, there are SNP baselines available, uh, probably through the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, but I don't think they're going to be comprehensive enough for Pacific Rim coverage. So, uh, trying to estimate a stock composition on Pacific Rim basis could be a little problematic. Next slide. For coho salmon, uh, it's a very similar to uh, Chinook. There are uh, some regional uh, coho salmon uh, microsatellite baselines available. I presume the Russians likely have some. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, a, a reasonable North American baseline that, that has seen application a number of times. We have developed a SNP baseline, uh, and that includes Russian uh, and uh, American and Canadian populations. Like, but like uh, with uh, Chinook salmon, we're lacking uh, Western Alaska and Central Alaska populations. Next slide. Okay, for, for pink salmon, um, it, it's the more uh, problematic species. Now, because of, uh, um, there are even and odd brood lines in, in, in pink salmon that are essentially, you have to keep them separate in order to do a stock composition analysis. Right? So, so pinks are, are like having two separate species. 
Now, we have a, a regional baseline for uh, pink salmon based on microsatellites. It's good from southeast Alaska through to Washington. Uh, we, we do have a few other Alaskan populations and a few Russian populations, but it, it is in, by no means available, ready to go for mixed up analysis on, on the high seas. The Alaska Department of Fish and Game, I believe, has a regional SNP baseline that, that they have available. Uh, they developed one for looking at uh, pink salmon in uh, Prince William Sound and I think have included uh, populations from, from Asia and probably other Alaskan populations. But again, it's probably not comprehensive enough to be applied to uh, samples derived from the Pacific Ocean, from, from, from the mid-Pacific Ocean where both Asian and North American uh, pink salmon could, could be a, a, available. Uh, next slide. I think this is probably the last slide here. So I, I'm, I'm just going to, to uh, wrap up and, and review where I think we are with uh, applying uh, genetic baselines for IC stock identification. For, for chum and stock, I, I, I think we're in, in quite good shape uh, that we have operational either SNP or Microsatellite baselines for both species. I think we have good representation from both North America and Asian populations. So I, I think we're basically, we're pretty good to go and for, for those species. Chinook and coho are a, a different matter. And for the baselines that we have developed in our laboratory, we would need a Western and Central Alaskan populations added to our baselines to make them more reliable in terms of estimation of stock composition. Now, if we are presented with a high seas sample and it includes uh, populations from, from either Western or Central Alaska, we can provide an estimate of stock composition, but there's going to be some bias associated with it. I think we'll probably overestimate the Russian com component and probably the northern uh, southeast Alaska com component. So we have similar problems with Chinook and Coho, although for Chinook, we, we have a fairly good representation of uh, the, the Yukon. Pink salmon is the most uh, problematic species from, from my perspective. Uh, we, I don't think anybody has a Pacific Rim baseline that they would be prepared to go with at this time for mixed stock analysis. Uh, we have the uh, our regional microsatellite baseline, uh, Alaska Department of Fish and Game probably has a regional SNP baseline. But I believe that the, the future would uh, uh, tend towards having an operational SNP baseline for pink salmon. We have thought about it in, in our laboratory from time to time. Um, we attempted to get some funding for it at one stage, but weren't, su weren't successful. If we developed a a SNP baseline for pinks, we would likely incorporate all of the genetic markers that have been developed through the Alaska Park and Fishing Game as well as adding some of our own. You can see the time is uh, winding down, so I will wrap it up there and uh, open for questions. Thanks, Terry. Hi, Brian. How are you? Oh, pretty good. Should I introduce you now so people know who you were? <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get connected soon enough, I guess. <clears throat> so that was a long, long, long time friend, Dr. Terry Beecham from the Pacific Biological Station. And uh, so thank you, Terry. I think this is really an important point to bring up. Many of us probably assume these baselines continue to develop, but, but they take quite a bit of work. And that, and so 
your accomplishments are certainly impressive, but we still have some needs if we apply it in the open ocean. So Mark, yes. we got any questions? Yeah, hi, Brian. Hi, Terry. Um, no questions, although I, I've got one. Um, so, Terry, when we've got um, samples that have been taken from these um, from these expeditions, and we have sort of incomplete baselines, are, do we do we lose anything if they're being analyzed against a particular baseline, or can we go back when the baselines improve and and rerun them again? You can certainly go back. We have have done that in the past with mixed dock samples, when we have uh, a, a more complete baseline, we simply rerun this, this, this same fish through, through, our, through the genetic stock identification software. Okay. Um, uh, what would be your take on sort of, the, I think we talked about it earlier, and I know the working group uh, on stock ID for NPAFC was uh, going to be discussing this, but it, it, if we want to pick up and, and fill in these baselines, or, or I think at the time you were saying it's probably about a, a half a million dollars is is what's required to, for that effort. Is, is, is that still, after you've uh, looked at it a little bit, is that still what we're thinking? Well, for, for pink salmon, um, yeah, I mean, there, there's a fair bit of work required to have operational baseline for, for pinks, given that we need separate baselines for both the even and, and odd years. Uh, but half a million, half a million Canadian dollars, yeah, it's a good ballpark figure to work with. <laughs> okay, uh, just, uh, we do have a question that's uh, come in here uh, from uh, we. Uh, how do you decide which baseline microsatellite or SNPs, you will apply for mixed stock analysis. Thank you. For, for our domestic purposes, for Chinook and Coho, we always apply the SNP baseline because we have twinned it with parentage-based tagging. So we can get, provide very high resolution stock identification and we can uh, determine the age of, of the fish as well. Our preference is to go with a SNP baseline uh, because we can um, essentially genotype individuals that 550 SNPs in, in a single polymerase chain reaction. So we have a much higher resolution and, and our estimated stock compositions when, when we use SNPs. We are in the process of changing all of our baselines from microsatellites to SNPs. But, you know, there's, so there's, I, there's nothing with microsatellites. You know, you, it's just that uh, they're a little more cumbersome to use and it's, they're, and they're, there are problems with standardization amongst uh, allele sizes amongst laboratories. So I, I know we're going to hear from uh, Christoph about the at sea genetic stock ID, but um, this technology changes so rapidly. Um, and w what would be your your take on what's right around the corner? Um, you know, are, are SNPs going to be obsolete, or is there new sequencing technology? What, what's going to be the next big advancement that we should be pulling in as we we try to take on this this big job of understanding the where these fish are in the, in the North North Pacific? Well, I don't see anything past SNPs. Um, you know, the, the real big change in stock ID work, I think, came with direct sequencing of mm -hmm. DNA. And you can direct sequence either microsatellites or SNPs. Uh, the tendency has been to use SNPs because you can get hundreds of them genotyped in, in a single reaction. And they're very powerful. You, you can tailor your the panel SNPs that, that you use to include both neutral and uh, SNPs on, under selection. So um, I guess what what are the We're what would you see as the mark? Oh, sorry. Okay. No, happy to. Okay. Happy to we'll come back later. Up. But I think to stay okay. on time and to respect Christoph. Thanks, Terry. Great update. Okay. Our Thank next you. speaker is a younger version, and he's uh, Christoph Dieg, who is a postdoc with the UBC and the Pacific Salmon Foundation. Christoph has been on both vessels, or in both cruises, I should say, and uh, assisted Alexi as one of the chief scientists in the 2020 cruise. 
So Christoph, uh, we'd welcome your talk. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the nice introduction, Brian. And uh, it's very nice to follow Terry because he introduced all the wonderful concepts for me already. So uh, let's dive right into it. I'm going to try to share my screen here with you guys. And uh, here we go. All right. So uh, since I'll be talking multiple times, I thought I'd make this a three-part series of what's out there. And part one is going to be the ATSI genetic stock identification in the Gulf of Alaska. And so uh, to recapitulate basically what Terry had told you before, um, why do we need stock identification? Uh, because at sea salmon mix and we'd like to know where they're from. We need that for uh, management of harvest, enhancement, as well as conservation. For instance, you can see conservation units of coho salmon on the right here. Um, we also uh, so that has been done in the past using scales, parasites, allozymes, and coated wire tags that are still used in uh, hatchery fish. Um, but more recently, genetic methods have been used, like the uh, mini and microsatellites that Terry has introduced, as well as the single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. So Terry already introduced to you what SNPs are. So I have just another uh, picture up there that basically uh, shows you what it is with the a different a letter in the DNA at the same location in different individuals. And so basically, if you want to do genetic stock identification by single nucleotide polymorphism, you have to sequence a bunch of uh, different fish to figure out where your SNPs are. Then you design primers to amplify the region that contains the SNPs, and then use the sequence a bunch of different individuals of known origin to uh, basically uh, figure out what are the SNPs associated in a specific origin. And then you have your baseline. And at that point, you can uh, sequence a fish of unknown origin and compare its SNPs with the baseline and basically then assign it. Um, the methods so far that have been used basically all require uh, laboratory-based sequencing. So uh, what Terry's lab mostly uses is, for instance, the ion torrent system, um, which is a big sequencer, but there's also direct uh, qPCR platforms like the Fluidime EP1. But what all of these have in common is they're very large and they need infrastructure. So oftentimes, when you want to do genetic stock identification and you're under time pressure, what you end up is you end up flying the sample to the lab as fast as possible to get it analyzed overnight. And so the idea was uh, to develop something where you can, instead of bringing the sample to the lab, bring the lab to the sample. And so uh, I was brought into the uh, 2019 Gulf of Alaska expedition with this as one of my objectives to develop a mobile uh, genetic stock identification system. And we decided to use the Oxford Nanopore Minion system. You can see that on the top right here. And that basically is a handheld sequencer that's about the size of a smartphone. And uh, it, is, it says it's pretty light and portable and it requires relatively little infrastructure the downsides of it is it has a relatively high error rate and has relatively low throughput. But um, in uh, two, within two months, we came up with a rough plan of how we could make it work. And we took it out in the Gulf of Alaska. And I did uh, try it on a bunch of salmon out there. And specifically, in this case, it was coho salmon. So you can see on the right side, the, basically, the map where we caught the coho salmon. And here is my uh, sequencing setup that I used aboard the Professor Kaganowski. And basically, I had a PCR cycler on the right here. I had a vortex machine. I had two different kind of centrifuges. I had a magnetic bead rack, an array of pipettes, a qubit for uh, uh, DNA quantification. I had my laptop to do the processing of the sequencing. And in the bottom left, on top of the laptop, you can see the actual uh, sequencer. So you can see how small it is. And then, of course, we had a nice sticker of the Orthodox Holy Trinity for spiritual support during this uh, daring endeavor. And so the workflow of the pipeline that uh, we called uh, nano to geno or N2G, basically in the first step, I extracted uh, DNA from a fin club from a fish. And uh, then I used uh, a, a primer kit, a primer set panel rather, to amplify the regions that contain the SNPs. And that's basically what Terry's been talking about earlier. So basically, I used um, the primer set targeting the SNPs that Terry had designed and his group had designed earlier to amplify the regions containing the SNPs. And the next step, 
we used the Oxford Nanopore barcoding kit to barcode the sequences, and that basically allowed us to identify which sequence came from what fish. At this point, we could throw them all together. And then I added inverse adapters that allowed the sequence just to act as primers for each other and basically concatenate them. So what you end up in the end with is one large DNA molecule that contains multiple loci containing SNPs from different, uh, uh, potentially different individuals in one long read. And that was our strategy to deal with the low throughput of the sequencer, basically to get more information per read. And uh, basically at that point we were ready for sequencing. And once the sequencing had been done, then the computational workflow uh, started and that uh, was developed with the help of Ben Sutherland from uh, uh, the Pacific Biological Station in Nanaimo. And basically uh, while at C, I used uh, a, a Ubuntu Linux system that was running the uh, Minnow program to do the base calling. So basically to turn the raw uh, data into the classic DNA sequence that you know and love. And, and the first step was then to deconcatenate the sequence uh, uh, computationally. And we used Porchop for that. Then we used Porchop to bin the sequences by barcode. So that allowed us to identify which fish, what, spe uh, what sequence was from. Then we aligned these sequences to the reference genome with BWA. And then we could, uh, according to this, score the uh, SNPs. Um, we used a custom script that we wrote specifically for that. And then with that score, we could compare that score to the baseline and do the actual uh, mixed stock assignment and uh, using the classic Rubius program, that, which is the standard program used for this task. So while at sea, I ran two runs when the fish became available since we caught a lot fewer fish than we thought. I ran it with a, a little fewer individuals than we had initially planned. So in the first run, I ran it on 31 coho and two Chinook. In the second run, I ran it on 44 coho and one Chinook. Unfortunately, I had a little mistake in the first run because of rough seas and I made a mistake priming the flow cells. So the first run didn't really work. So we decided to uh, resequence basically right up on return using the same platform uh, all 80 coho that were caught during the expedition. And then we also used samples from these to resequence them on the standard platform that is commonly used in uh, Terry's and uh, Ben's lab. And basically we used the iron torrent system with the matching uh, baseline that I use for my experiment, as well as with the updated newer baseline that had a better resolution of Northern stocks. And so how were the results? Well. Uh, this graph basically shows you our read length distribution because I told you that we concatenated the reads to increase the throughput. So as we expected from our uh, roughly 5 million reads in the raw sequences you see in blue here, there were uh, longer sequences, more common. So basically you can see the length on the x-axis and the number of reads on the y-axis. And you can see we have a bunch of longer reads in the raw reads, but when we deconcatenate them to break them down into the individual SNP containing amplicons, they shrink in size, but increase in number. So basically we had a two times inflammation, uh, infl inflation rather uh, in read numbers, which basically meant we could increase our throughput twofold with the concatenation strategy, thereby circumventing one of the uh, drawbacks of the uh, Minion platform. And then uh, with barcoding, that's the final step where you assign the sequences to a fish and bin them so-called M. Um, we unfortunately lost again a bunch of sequences because binning and barcoding rather has not been very efficient. So we lost about 40% of the sequences. Now, when we assign these sequences to the individual, you can see down here, uh, every yeah. little uh, one here is an individual fish. And uh, the uh, y-axis is the number of reads per amplicon. And basically this little uh, violin plot just shows you what is the distribution of reads per amplicon. And you can see that despite the fact that I did not do any normalization, there's still a relatively even distribution between the different individuals. And uh, what we needed for base calling or for rather stock identification was to get at least 141 loci containing a SNP being determined. And basically the numbers up here determines how many loci were determined. And in blue, you can see the ones that didn't make the cutoff. And in white, you can see the ones that made the cutoff. And we also had that criterion that for the nanopore, since we expected a higher error rate, we wanted at least 10 sequences aligned to one loci to determine what kind of a base was it at the locus. And so with that, we can make a general estimation that we need at least uh, 2000 sequences per individual to include it in proper uh, stock identification downstream. And for that runway, I used 80 individuals, 50 of them passed that threshold. So that's 
63%. And then uh, I looked into like what are the specific differences between the different sequencing platforms and a couple of uh, problems that became apparent is for instance, that Nanopore has problems resolving homopolymers and homopolymers are regions where there are multiple uh, rep repetitions of the same nucleotide, for instance. In this sequence up here, there's a lot of Ts, but the SNP location we're interested in is right after that, that A. And you can see in the bottom here, that's the iron torrent reads. The iron torrent platform has no problem resolving all these Ts, but because of the special way that the nanopore works, where the DNA is threaded through a pore, it has a hard time determining um, how many of a specific base there are when there is multiple repetitions of the same one. So you can see that up here in the reads that basically the alignment is screwed there and we cannot determine exactly what uh, base is at that interest, interesting SNP locus. So because of that, we, I had to exclude 15 loci. After uh, uh, SNP calling, we, I, we compared the two uh, platforms. And so on this PCRA graph, you can see uh, the dots representing individuals and the same individuals are uh, on blue from the iron torrent platform and on red on the nanopore platform. And you can see that there's a quite a nice distribution between individuals showing that they're from different origins, but you can also see there's a systemic discrepancy between the two. And that is partially because the nanopore has a preference to call heterozygous uh, loci. But overall, we managed to get 84% uh, identical calls from the nanopore to the iron torrent platform. So in 84% of cases, we call it the same uh, SNPs. And so when you use that to do the stock assignment, you see basically that in the nanopore in the, in the middle and the iron torrent on the right, on both cases, Southeast Alaskan stocks are dominating the mixture. There's also a strong uh, uh, contribution of Lower Stikeen River, which is in orange here. But what you can also see is that uh, Lower Hecate Strait in green is uh, prominent in the iron torrent. It's actually the second most abundant uh, reporting unit, which is not uh, uh, captured in the nanopore and rather in the nanopore these are all assigned to the southeastern alaskan stock and you can see in the blue columbia river fish are confidently assigned in both cases and so overall we had a 60.1 uh, 61 percent match in uh, reporting unit assignment and collection which is the more fine grain resolution we had 56 percent match between the two platforms in the assignment and that doesn't sound too good but that's not really all the fault of the nanopore because of using fish from the Gulf of Alaska might not have necessarily been the best way to test a new platform because as Terry uh, described, um, there are some gaps in where we have coverage with the baseline for coho salmon. And so you can see that in that graph on the bottom left here, you have in white a normal distribution. And if uh, your fish are perfectly matched with the baseline, they should overlay the normal distribution perfectly. But in the lighter blue, you can see the iron torrent. You can see that some individuals nicely match the normal distribution, but there are also a bunch of individuals that fall outside of it. And in the nanopore, we have the same. There's a small peak that falls on the outside on the left. And there's one on the right as well. And uh, the probably you can see an overall right shift that is probably the nanopore bias with it. And indeed, when these fish, like when the fish were resequenced using the newer baseline and panel, we found that a lot of the fish that were flip-flopping between the two panels from the Hecate Strait in Southeast Alaska, and they were actually assigned to a region in a northern, northern uh, BC coast. And so they're basically adjacent to the two regions between which they flip-flop back and forth between the platforms. So to summarize, um, with the mobile GSI for 80 individuals, we were able to do stock assignment for 50 of them at 84% agreement with the iron torrent platform, 61% uh, reporting unit match, and uh, the turnaround uh, well, with this uh, system was uh, 14 hours in the wet lab, sequencing for 12 hours, and then unfortunately two to three days base calling because the laptop couldn't handle the big requirements. But we have since updated the workflow using a new primer panel that makes two steps of the workflow obsolete, and thereby saving Saving two hours, we're using a newer flow cell that has a lower error rate, and we now have a mobile commuting, uh, computing unit called the Minute that allows us to do actual real-time base calling. And with that, we're at uh, 36 hours turnaround, which is obviously quite a bit better. But unfortunately, I haven't, done the pro I haven't been able to do the proper analysis of any of those runs yet because of uh, several COVID-related re uh, sh uh, shortings in supply. So stay tuned for the updated version of that, and hopefully it will be a little bit better. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take some questions.
Oh yes, I, I did already. Sorry. No. Yeah, it's cancelled. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we're there. Yep. Good. All Thanks, right, Christoph. One had no idea that you were hiding in the bowels of the Kraganowski and that. Yeah. Doing all of that. I was. I was down there doing the dissecting the fish and sequencing away and just bouncing around the waves. It was wonderful. Well, I'm glad so we you had a question. Okay. <laughs> we had a, we had a question uh, from at the end of the last session that didn't we didn't get to, and it's uh, related to this one. Uh, do you have plans to do this real time sampling in 2022? Uh, well, I personally don't have plans. I think it would be super cool to do it, but. Um, I think the biggest requirement, uh, the biggest problem is rather manpower. So I know for a fact that uh, on the Canadian vessel, that is already super short on manpower. And you would need a person that can really focus on this for like a day at a time. And then once you work for a day, you also probably need a little bit of recovery time after. I can tell you that from my own personal experience. So um, I think mm -hmm. as far as I know, at least for the Canadian vessel, that is uh, the limiting factor there. I am not sure about uh, the Russian vessels, which I know are larger. So if there's the potential to bring a person on board to do it, I think it would be super cool to do it. Um, but the the technology is basically there at this point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how would you see it being applied uh, at sea? What would be yeah, so basically um, Terry talked about that the uh, Sockeye baseline is uh, relatively good comparatively to uh, the coho. And so uh, there's always the interest to figure out where are the Fraser River sockeye, right? Because specifically from a BC perspective. And uh, you, if you do the stock ID at sea on sockeye and you realize that, okay, these are the areas where the sockeye are hiding, um, then you can send the gill netter out to get some more samples on them and try to figure out what's going on specifically with them. So that would be uh, something very useful for the upcoming uh, Pan Pacific expedition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, some uh, the reality of an encounter response kind of survey in in, in real time. <clears throat> uh, question from uh, Yurawasan, uh, Christoph. Uh, nice presentation. Uh, during the 2019 expedition, we tagged and released two coho salmon, but they were not recovered. Meanwhile, you could identify the origins of these coho uh, by at CGSI. Maybe we don't need high seas tagging anymore, except for archival tagging. Do you agree? Well, to some degree, I mean, the the tagging process, I remember, was quite stressful on the fish, and it was hugely complicated getting the life box out there. So uh, if we can get the same information using the GSI, then I would say, why not use it? It's definitely cheaper than bringing the life box out. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot more reasons for it than that, even that recovering these animal, <clears throat> animals when you don't know where they're destined to is a, an additional challenge and a huge one. Yeah, okay. I believe one of those Mark individuals Bam. was from Goldstream, if I remember correctly. One of, one of the coho? Yeah, I think so, from looking at the oh. stock ID data. So we've got a question from Cameron Freshwater. Uh, what is the maximum number of samples, uh, individuals, that could be reasonably processed in a given day with the current setup? Yeah, so the, the maximum number as we run it right now is uh, 80 to 90. Um, but um, you can, in theory, run multiple chips at a time. I mean, there's nothing stopping you from running multiple ones. That The workflow really does not drastically increase the workload if you were doing more than that. So I guess similar from uh, Lori Whitecamp. Great talk, Christoph. Does it take 36 hours no matter how many fish you run? No, if you run less fish, there's less computational work to be done. So it definitely goes faster. So you can probably cut off 10 hours from that. Okay, Mark, we're bang on schedule here. And okay. uh, our next speaker is the same young guy and that. <laughs> and uh, so Christoph, I'll uh, yeah. let you take on the final one for today. On Thank you. EDNA. This one's going to be a good one. All right. Uh, let's yeah, turn on my screen sharing again. <laughs> oh, this one's gonna be. I'm more excited about this one. This is wonderful. Uh, give me a second. 
Okay. So here we go. So part two of what's out there, environmental DNA survey of the winter somatosphere in the Gulf of Alaska. So environmental DNA, what is it? It's the study of free DNA in the environment because all animals and critters that live in the ocean constantly shed DNA, be it through their skin fluffing off or through their feces or from injuries or decomposing bodies. There's constantly DNA accumulating as well as degrading, but we can collect the DNA and analyze it. And that is quite informative. And so we did it in the Gulf of Alaska expedition. And basically the goal was A, to ground truth eDNA, but also to provide supplemental information, uh, information on salmon, their prey, predators, and competitors. And we collected samples from all uh, oceanographic sites from both years. And then at sea, basically we collected five liters from four to four, uh, two to four meters depth, um, filtered them on Sterivax columns, and then froze them. And in between this, the different samples, we cleaned the, with bleach and water. And in 2020, we also added sodium thiosulfate, which deactivates the bleach and turns out that that actually increases our ability to detect species. So that's why 2020 results are even better than 2019. And uh, then once the samples get back to the lab, we extract the DNA from the filters and then amplify the 16S and uh, uh, cytochrome coaxidase as cytochrome oxidase uh, genes from the mitochondria because there's more mitochondria than nuclei in the cell so that uh, increases our ability to detect um, and then we sequence those on the Lumina platforms with 300 cycles and single end and then again uh, I used a pipeline provided by my great uh, collaborator Ben Sutherland that uh, uses uh, the OBTools platform to demultiplex and then uh, blast and Megan to assign to actual taxa. And basically this is what our results then look like. So here's an example for sockeye. I'm gonna show you a similar layout uh, repeatedly. So you're gonna have the eDNA on the left, the catch on the right. Um, in the top row, you can see it resolved um, for stations. And in the bottom, you can basically see uh, an abundance estimate based on the same data. And what you can see that for 2019, sockeye were detected roughly in the same regions, but on fewer sites, then they were caught. And the overall distribution in both cases uh, says there's a higher distribution of sockeye towards the north of the area, but the eDNA also suggests that there's a little bit stronger distribution in the central part of the area. In 2020, as I said, the results were better. That's why we have a better agreement of eDNA and catch. So in both cases, there's a high concentration of uh, sockeye salmon in uh, the northwestern part of the area, as well as on the continental shelf where we also caught a few. For Chinook salmon, we didn't detect any in 2019, but we caught three, but the distribution from three individuals is uh, pretty meaningless. In uh, 2020, we caught a lot of Chinook uh, right on the continental shelf near Vancouver Island, and we also detected them close to it, but we also detected a large number of them in the southern, uh, south central part of the survey area. And so that gives us a distribution of a strong distribution along the coast as you would expect, but also a little bit of a south central area in uh, the eDNA. Steelhead were not detected or caught in 2019. So I'm only gonna show 2020 data. Um, we caught one at the south central area as, as well, but we detected them along the southern perimeter multiple times, specifically strong in the furthest south western corner, which gives us for both a strong distribution towards the southwest of the survey area. Uh, coho were only detected once in 2019, which was a little bit surprising, but the detection was in the area of highest catch, which again results in a similar distribution towards the south central part of the study area. In 2020, on the other hand, we had the very strong, very large catch uh, in the beginning of the uh, trawls in the south central part of the area. And we also detected a strong signal in the same uh, region for the eDNA, but we also detected a strong eDNA signal further west as well as north. And so that gives us a picture that's a little bit different than from the catches. So you can see that the center of distribution is further to the west uh, from the eDNA as well as another second peak that's lower in the north. But strikingly, um, this since eDNA has a half-life, that's kind of a window into the past. And so that could suggest that indeed these fish were moving towards the shelf, towards the east, as Alexi has mentioned before, during that time. For chum salmon, uh, they were basically caught all throughout the region in 
2019, therefore giving us a strong distribution specifically towards the uh, south uh, western part. And similarly, the eDNA says the greatest distribution is towards the western part with a little bit more towards the east. Um, in 2020, however, this, the picture is similar to Coho, where we again see the strongest catches uh, in the south central part, but the strongest eDNA slightly shifted to the west, again suggesting that there might be, have been a movement of fish towards the east. And finally, pink salmon, that was the most exciting one for me, because uh, in 2019, we primarily caught it among the southern perimeter and a, a few in the central area, which gives us this uh, south central distribution. Whereas in uh, eDNA detections, we, collect, we also detected them in the south, but we also had a very strong detection in the northern part of the area. So that actually gives us a quite different distribution where there is the suggestion that there were actually quite a number of pink salmon in the northern part of the study area. Um, in 2020, the picture basically nicely recapitulates what we've seen before for uh, Chum and Coho, that the eDNA suggests that there was a stronger signal towards uh, the west, meaning fish could have been moving east. And we also have a strong signal from the north that's a little bit stronger than the small catches of pink salmon we had in the north on the continental shelf. So the summary for salmon eDNA finding is that pink salmon were present in the north in 2019. And uh, pink chum and coho may have been moving east towards the continental shelf in the southern Gulf of Alaska in 2020. Uh, moving on to predators of salmon, that is a topic that has always come up whenever we talked about eDNA because we caught surprisingly few of them in our trawls and uh, the only ones we caught, uh, caught were daggertooth on the left and uh, dogfish on the right here. And basically these maps show you uh, where we caught or detected them in the eDNA, so the squares are captures and the triangles are eDNA detections and in uh, blue you can see 2019 and in red, you can see 2020, and you can see that we caught a few uh, dagatus all throughout the area, specifically on the continental shelf, but we also have a detection uh, in the eDNA that's quite next to uh, capture for 2020, so that kind of confirms the catches. And for dogfish, the picture looks similar. All of our catches were along the southern perimeter of the study area, where we also have a number of eDNA detections, but we also have some uh, eDNA detections further north. So going into more details for dogfish in this case, I told you there was one detection in the south in 2019 and several more in 2020. And when we overlay that with the overall distribution of salmon in the area for the respective years, so 2019 on the left, 2020 on the right, we can see that uh, the dogfish detection here was kind of, in 2019, was kind of outside of the uh, main distribution area for salmon, whereas in 2020, at least one in the, uh, detection was smack in the middle of the highest salmon distribution and another, uh, a few other individuals were further towards the west, again, suggesting that maybe these uh, were following the salmon distribution or just hanging around where salmon used to be. Now, salmon sharks, this one's a big one. Everyone has always asked me about salmon sharks because salmon sharks were hypothesized to be one of the main predators of uh, Pacific salmon but uh, we didn't see or caught, catch any during the surveys. And indeed, in 2019, we have a few detections uh, that are relatively strong in the central part of the study area. And in 2020, the detections are towards the east, uh, towards the west rather. And when we overlay that with the salmon distribution, we can see that the uh, salmon sharks basically in 2020 uh, 19, we're smack in the middle of the area of high salmon distribution. And in 2019, uh, sorry, rather in 2020, where the salmon kind of split off into a uh, south central area and a lot more salmon towards the west of the study area. All of our detections are mostly towards the very western perimeter of the study area, suggesting that indeed these sharks were further towards the west. Uh, Orcas or killer whales were detected throughout the survey area in 2019. Again, overlaying pretty nicely with the main distribution of salmon. And uh, when we look at 2020, uh, it also looks like these are following the salmon. So they're lagging a little bit behind of the presumptive movement of, of the majority of salmon towards the east. Dulls porpoise, which we observed visually quite a lot, um, were detected in both years as well. Again, the detection of them really nicely overlays with the uh, hotspots for salmon distribution and uh, for both years really so it really seems like dull purposes are really co-localized with 
uh, salmon abundance. And then uh, we also detected uh, Lancet fish on the left here in one instant. Uh, we detected a lingcot right on the continental shelf, so where you would expect it. And as I've shown you before, we detected one dagatooth. We also detected a number of marine mammals that maybe are uh, predators of salmon, some more so than others. So we detected sperm, uh, sperm whales where we did observe them visually as well. We detected fin whales both on the continental shelf as well as in the middle of the uh, Gulf of Alaska. Uh, we detected a gray whale on the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, to cl more closely towards the continental shelf, we detected a cell sea lion in 2020. As well, in 2020, we detected uh, a, a elephant seal in the southern, uh, southeastern corner of the study area. And here's a little bit of an oddball. We have a ton of harbor seal detections in the middle of the Gulf of Alaska in 2019. And that was really surprising. I talked to a lot of people, and really everyone said, this does not make sense. But as I said, it over, as I showed you before, like the predator overlays really nicely with the distribution of salmon abundance, really in both years. And uh, I'm not yet proposing that there is a pelagic harbor seal population, but you know, maybe we should keep our eyes open in the future to see if maybe we can actually see or catch them out there. And otherwise, I've talked to, to a lot of people about this, and we've come up with several possible explanations that could be the case. One of them would be that since once of, most of our detections were in 2019 and there was a cat in the lab in 2019, maybe there was seal and the cat food of the, uh, of the cat. Or another option that has been proposed by Lori Whitecap is that maybe this could be uh, DNA that is uh, shed in the feces of killer whales that were actually eating them. Anyways, uh, I'd say the seal situation, the harbor seal situation is not resolved at this point, but an overall summary, um, indeed, we were able to detect large salmon predators in the Gulf of Alaska, and they co-localized really nicely, specifically for uh, harbor seal, uh, doll's porpoise, and salmon shark with the abundance of salmon. And uh, if you want to hear more about predators, stay tuned for tomorrow because there will be a specific talk about this by Lori and Sabrina. Um, now I'm going to show you a few other species that I looked into a little bit. So for instance, in this case, uh, the squid Gonatopsis borealis, which is one of the higher, more higher abundant uh, squid species in the Gulf of Alaska. And on the right, you can see the catches. On the left, the eDNA detection top row is 2019, bottom row is 2020. You can see again that 2020 had a little better eDNA detections because of the update in our protocol. But what you can also see on the color is the time that uh, the detection or catch was made. And you can see that for catches, basically almost all of them are during the night uh, in both years. And that is because uh, these squids are vertical migrators. That means they spend their uh, day deep down in the water and come up at night to feed in the top layers, which is why you catch them at night. However, since DNA has a half-life of probably a day or two, uh, in the winter waters of the Gulf of Alaska, um, we can detect them regardless of the time of the day. So you can see that in 2019 and specifically in 2020, we can see them basically irrespective of time of day. And uh, the same is true for mctophids. So mctophids uh, is a species that of vertically migrating fish that are also called lantern fish. And similar to squid, they spend the day in the deeper water and come at night up to feed, that's why we catch them at night, but eDNA can detect them regardless. And so to summarize these two, basically, the eDNA can detect vertical migrants irrespective of sampling times. In some cases, even better during the day than during the night, because I guess they leave all their DNA around during the night, and then you can detect it nicely during the day. So for squid, uh, we detected squid DNA uh, with eDNA at day and night, almost at the same rate, actually slightly higher day and night, but in the trawl, only in 20% of trawl, day trawls were, were some caught, but in 91% of night trawls did we catch squid. And for mctophids, it's similar. Basically, eDNA was detected in 80% of uh, samples, irrespective of whether it was day or night. But uh, trawl catches of uh, mctophids were only in 8.6% uh, of trawls, but in 86% of night trawls. So if you want to hear more about squid, uh, also stay tuned for day two that, because Svetlana will talk about them and Albina will cover more about the mctophids also on day two. 
And then as a little uh, gem at the end, um, I also want to tell you a little bit about the uh, researcher diet in the Gulf of Alaska, which is kind of a tale of contamination. So in the center here, you can see a picture of one of the not so pleasant catches that we had during the expedition where we basically caught sausages, grapes, and broccoli. Basically, this is contamination from the boat. And this is very prominently featured in the eDNA. So I made a little comparison of the diet of the Professor Kaganowski versus the Pacific Legacy. And, and up here, you can see the overall reed contribution. You can see that in both cases, most of the reeds are from pork. And down here, I broke it down by sample, basically how many meals were, had what meat in it. And basically, if you're on the fence about which nation you should join for the 2022 Pan Pacific Expedition, well, if you like beef, you should go on a Canadian vessel. That's all I can say. And in general, I would highly recommend that in none of the vessels, there should be salmon on the menu for the upcoming expedition. So looking forward, what else is there to be done? Uh, for the 2019, 2020 samples, um, I need to figure out the detailed distributions of all the species. I wanna uh, uh, do proper uh, community compositions in different parts of the sample areas. I also need to look into other fish species that haven't been analyzed yet. And then we're still hoping to sequence the samples with specific primers for invertebrates to really get at the zooplankton communities. And then, of course, for 2022, we want to run a Pan Pacific survey and get samples from all locations. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and am open to questions yet again. Those are some very interesting results, obviously. And that. Mark, are you seeing any questions popping up as we end oh, our evening here? Yeah, uh, they're starting to come in here. Oh, boy, yeah, they're pinging in. You're a big seller here, uh, Christoph. Yeah, you're a good showman, too. So, um, Dear Chris, this is from uh, Vladimir Rodchenko. Uh, thank you for your great – oh, sorry, I can put it onto the <clears> – <throat> Uh, thank you for your great talk. Please remind me what depths were sampled for eDNA. Yeah. Do you so summarize? We, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. No. If you, you answer, and I'll carry on after that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we we were aiming for two to three meters, but obviously with the movement of the ship, um, that kind of moves around a little bit. So that's why I said the samples were taken from uh, two to four meters. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you summarize results of sampling from several depths at one station for your talk? Um, so, as I said, this was only from one depth, but we do plan for uh, 2022 to sample multiple depths so we have a better overview of which re what species are present at what depths. That, I think, will be really informative in the future. Ah, and Vladimir says... The second mate on the Professor Kaganowski told him in 2019 he saw a couple of seals, but I didn't trust him. <laughs> yeah, maybe so he was maybe, right. Maybe you got to maybe you got to call the uh, the second mate up. Um, uh, from Chris, uh, thanks, uh, Christoph. Great, great to see these data. How did mammal detections of whales from eDNA correspond to visual sightings? I'm not sure I saw this in your talk. Great use of eDNA for vertical migrators and for a crew diet. Hmm. Yeah, um, I, so I didn't uh, locate the whale sightings with the uh, actual uh, eDNA detections properly because I didn't have the time coming up to this yet, but Chris did send me the data. That's why she's asking because I requested the data from her and I uh, will do that in the future. But I can tell you that from what I do remember, we did detect um, the sperm whales in the same areas where we did see them. So that's a partial answer to the question. Great. Uh, from Francis Juanez, nice to hear from you, Francis. Uh, great talk. Um, are your salmon results robust enough to begin correlating DNA signal strength to abundance? This is a question I had as well. Christophe, yes. it looks like you had different sizes and it was numbers of reads, but how do you yes. think that relates to, to abundance? Yeah. Well, so that's why I showed the catch uh, abundance as well. And um, I think, as I said before, the results for 2020 are slightly better than for 2019. Um, and in that case, uh, the correlation looks really good. I haven't run any uh, proper stats yet to compare the two, but I would say that at least for 2020, uh, I think the strength 
of the signal is nicely correlated with salmon abundance. Mm -hmm. So those, those, so you, you, I mean, it's always been a, a question whether this eDNA can give you pre, just, pre, you know, obviously well, they'll do well on presence absence, but can abundance actually be right. meaningful? So it, I think it always depends on the context, but in a, in a case of salmon where you do have a lot of individuals around that constantly are shedding the, the DNA, um, you can actually do that in my opinion. That's why I didn't present these data for like the predators where we only have a number of detections, but for salmon where we have a, a large number of detections uh, that are really covering a range of reads, um, there is a relative good case to be made that we can actually uh, quantify abundance with that. Right, so you're getting sort of a, a, a relative index. You think there's a way to to actually relate the amount of DNA to the number of individuals and oh yes, I the, see what you say. Amount of biomass, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes and no. I that is somewhat problematic because, for instance, that would greatly differ between uh, winter and summer because in the summer your eDNA is going to degrade a lot faster. So you can basically compare it over let's say the winter survey because you have somewhat comparable conditions but you can would not be able to compare winter to a summer survey because your dna is going to degrade a lot faster in the summer so right. it always it... has some sort of a relative measure to it all right okay i'll, I'll uh, there's a question here from laurie whitecap uh great talk can you tell a stock of salmon from the eDNA? so stock uh, id in, in principle you could that do that in <laughs> practice i don't think so you would need a lot of dna and ideally from a rather homogeneous uh, school of salmon from a homogeneous origin of st uh, stock origin. Um, I know people have talked about this, but uh, specifically in the Gulf of Alaska, I don't think it's possible. Um, if you're approaching areas where higher densities are, where you can get even more DNA, you could in theory do it, um, but we don't have the proper setup at the moment, I believe, to do that. So maybe in the 10 years. Okay, um, so Jim Murphy asking, I think you you alluded to this in your talk, but he's asking, could you briefly explain how you collected eDNA in 2019 and 20 that resulted in much better detections? I right. believe it may be how you denatured the bleach. Uh, that yeah. is absolutely correct. So um, in 2019, we basically, in between all stations, we cleaned all our equipment with bleach and then just flushed it with uh, ultra pure water and basically we just had to use a lot of water to get all the bleach out, but you can never get rid of all the bleach uh, residues. And uh, for 2020, we basically introduced uh, sodium thiosulfate, which actually deactivates the bleach. And so that's, that got rid of any residual bleach in the system and that increased our ability to detect lower amounts of DNA. Mm -hmm. So increased our sensitivity. All right. Um, not seeing any more questions, uh, Brian. I'm not sure on our, our timeline. I guess I did have one question about steelhead um, because we didn't catch any in two, 2019. You didn't plot it, but did we? Did you send? Did you? Uh, did the eDNA show any steelhead in 2019? Nope. We, we, I did not detect any steelhead in 2019. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Christoph. Well, uh, we have come to the end of our first evening or morning, wherever you are. And that, so uh, I want to thank all the speakers, uh, wish everyone uh, adieu, and uh, we will meet again uh, tomorrow, late afternoon or morning again. And that, so thank you, everybody. Good night for now from Canada. <laughs>